right. Shalom. Most high in Christ. Bless Israel. Uh, bless Sabbath to you. My name is Brother Zerubbabel. My name is Ezra Zelazar. Uh, we are uh, with Children of Israel. And I want to make something clear that when we say we're with Children of Israel, what we're basically saying is that we are Israelites. We are the Children of Israel, just like all the rest of you so-called Blacks, Hispanics, and Native Americans are the Children of Israel. We are the Israelites that the, the Bible speaks of. Uh, we're not um, saying this as an exclusion that we're an, ex an excluded or enclosed camp or group like you will see a lot of the these other groups with these names and separations. That's why we chose this name is because we don't want the separation. We are the children of Israel. That's what the Most High causes. And that's what we're going to go by. You go 12 tribes of Israel. We are the Israelites. Uh, that's why you may see in some of our very first videos that we've done that we say, you know what? If you want to learn, learn. Uh, we're not here for you to follow us. We're here to teach you. You know what I mean? And wake our people up. Most people are under the impression that you have to join a camp in order to be recognized as an Israelite, which is not so. There are several of our forefathers in the scriptures that kept feast days and, and high holy days at home alone. And you know what I mean? And you read about them. There, there is nowhere in the scriptures that says that you have to be a part of one of these groups in order to be considered an Israelite where two or three are gathered in Christ's names, there he is in the midst of them. Christ himself says that. So it's time for us to stop listening to the, the verbiage of men that have an agenda because they want to have the biggest camp. They want to have the preeminence. They want to be the fastest growing camp. They want to make money. Uh, they want as many bodies in their camp as possible so that they can sell as many T-shirts and music CDs and videos and things like that as they possibly can. Um, it's a shame of what's going on in Israel that a lot of our people feel like they've got to join a camp in order you know, to uh, get salvation from the Most High. And that's not so. That that is a, a, a very very far fetched thing. Um, it is just simply not true. You're you're not going to get condemned by the Most High because you don't go join one of these camps. If you're reading and studying your Bible, you're learning, and you're getting wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, which is the keeping of the commandments and repenting. Just as Christ said, what do we have to do to get the kingdom? When that question was asked to him, when the young man came and said, good master, what good thing do I have to do in order to receive eternal life? Christ didn't turn to him and say, join a camp. That's not what he said. He said, keep the commandments. So we've got to stop listening to men and listen to the most high. Uh, which is bringing us to our topic uh, for today. Um, we're going to be going into um, our a uh, couple of feast days that we have coming up uh, this coming week, uh, which is uh, our fall feast or the, the fall season is coming upon us on Tuesday evening from Tuesday evening to Wednesday evening which we're going to go over uh, because that is scriptural. Um, and then we have the memorial blowing of trumpets, which is the beginning, the first day of the seventh month, uh, which we're going to be beginning on um, uh, Wednesday. Uh, I'm sorry, that's uh, Tuesday sundown to Wednesday sundown. And the uh, Intercalary day is Monday sundown to Tuesday sundown. Let me correct that. Uh, we're going to go over that. Um, exactly what these uh, high holy days are. Uh, 
Uh, most of you have heard about the memorial blowing of trumpets. Uh, what we're talking about as far as uh, the fall season coming along, there are four uh, what are called intercalary days. You may have heard that word intercalary being used by some of the other camps as far as um, maybe adding intercalary days to their, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, the lunar Sabbath. They, they, they've adopted this intercalary word from the book of Enoch, which is funny because they tell you not to read the book of Enoch. So we want to make sure that uh, we listen to the most high and stop listening to men that are trying to dis, uh, dissuade you from reading some of these other books. Um, and as we go through, it'll be clear as to why we'll listen to what's written rather than listening to men, because these men are going to lead you astray. Um, you know, they'll tell you not to read the book of Enoch. They'll tell you not to read Jasher or Jubilees. In fact, you know, they, they'll call people that read them bug outs, make fun of them, laugh at them, but yet will turn around and teach you lessons out of these very books that they say is written by the so-called white man and are fake. But yet they'll pick up all kinds of other books and teach you things out of these books. But when these books have things that contradict what the Most High teaches us, then they say, oh, you know what? That book is good. It's got some good information. You know, it might have some bones in it. That's what Israel does. We always make excuses for the things that we're doing wrong. And we're so used to it that it's become normalized in Israel. And this is the very thing that's got us in trouble to begin with from the very beginning, is not keeping the Most High's commandments and not doing what he told us to do. So we have got to uh, come to the understanding that, uh, and that's what we're going to do. We're going to first go through and show you uh, just, you know, a few scriptures to prove that these books were read by our forefathers. They are mentioned in the scriptures. They are quoted in the scriptures. We're not going to go over every detail, but we're going to give you a few to prove that these books are valid. Before I do that, though, I'm, I'm just going to just to show again the hypocrisy of our brothers in Israel. And it's sad that we have to do this because we shouldn't have to, but because there are men in Israel that have agendas, they're leading our people into the same destruction that our forefathers did, which is basically um, away from the commandments and, and not keeping them. All right, so I'll, I'll start off with this one. I'm sure every camp in Israel teaches out of this book from Babylon to Timbuktu by Rudolf R. Windsor. Now, Rudolf R. Windsor, as most of you know, he is he's a brother. He's one of he's one of ours. He's one of us. But I'm going to show you the hypocrisy of some of our brothers in Israel, because, as you know, even at camp, they'll pull out Babylon to Timbuktu. They'll teach out of it online. Swear up and down on it that, yeah, you know, one million Jews fled out of fed, fled out of Egypt and we're the Israelites. And da, 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 da. But they won't go and tell you that this same person that wrote that in this book teaches you that the so-called white man that they claim they hate so much are the children of Japheth. 
it is what it is. I'm going to go to it. This is uh, chapter book, chapter two. This is Babylon, the Timbuktu in the second chapter, which he titles the origin of the white race. I'm not going to read all of it, but you could go and read it for yourselves. I'm just going to read a, a, a bit of it. Um, I'm going to start. This is what about the fifth or sixth paragraph. You can see I have it where my finger is right here. I've got it highlighted right here where it says the third classification of mankind was the Jeff, uh, the Jeffites. That's where I'm going to start. It says the third classification of mankind was the Jeffites from Jephthah, who was the youngest son of Noah. The offspring of Japheth occupied the Isles of the Gentiles, the shore territories of the Mediterranean Sea in Europe and parts of Asia Minor, whence they dispersed northward over the entire continent of Europe and a great part of Asia. So most of us Israelites that have done studies knows that the Japhethites were not the Edomites, that they were not the so-called Caucasians of today. They kicked the original, they, they went in and they kicked out, they went to war with the original inhabitants of the land and they kicked them out of the land. They took it by force, they took it by war, by the sword. Okay, that's how they ended up there. But Christianity and apparently Rudolf R. Windsor in Babylon the Timbuktu teaches that Esau, or the so-called white man, or the Europeans, are the Japhethites, which is simply untrue. I think you're, you cut out for a second. Uh, but it is just simply untrue. But again, our brothers will pick up this book and teach you out of it, knowing that the author of this book completely contradicts the doctrine that most of us teach that Japheth is not the so-called Europeans. All right. So let me go to the uh, I'm going I'm going to page 22 as you can see. Can you see it? I'm going to page 22. The That's highlighted in pink. All right. It says, actually, I'll start in the, the one above it in the orange. It says, we have more than adequate proof that the white races began near the Caucasus Mountains, and from there they spread north, northwest, and northeast into Europe and Asiatic Russia. Now, we know that the Japhites, Europeans, are white today. Were they originally white beginning from their ancestor Japheth? Or did a change materialize in the skin color of the descendants of Japheth? This question is difficult to answer. I was told, listen to what he says again, I was told, which is a problem with a lot of our people, is that we love to listen to what we are told, but we don't like to go and read and research. It says, I was told that Japheth was a black man, but he wanted to be white, so God changed him to a white man. Evidence to that theory is lacking. Nevertheless, scientists and anthropologists have found different kinds of mutations in certain parts of the world. So then he starts going into genes and chromosomes and you know, all kinds of things of that nature. But that's what's written in this book. So the next time one of our brothers pulls this book out, ask him, why are you going to pull this out when it's got so-called bones in it, completely contradicts what almost all Israelite camps teach, that Japheth is not the so-called white man, but you still teach out of this book. 
that's why I'm this is the first time maybe that I, I can think of in any video we've done that we've actually pulled this book out unless to just show unless I've shown this before that um you know he contradicts but you don't see us teaching out of this book we don't take these books to camp with us for that very reason how are you how are you going to look when you're at camp you pull this book out and you've got some apologetics sitting there telling like you know what why are you pulling this book out when it contradicts your your um your doctrines and that's the case with almost all the books that you see Israel pulling outside of what's written, outside of the so-called Bible, Jasher, Jubilees, Enoch, outside of those books, are people, there are so many books that people are pulling up now reading and they have so many what they call bones in them, but we just dismiss them. But teach out of them anyway, but then turn around and tell our people, don't read Enoch. Don't read um, Jasher. Don't read uh, Jubilees and so on. There are a lot of books that were taken out of the scriptures. There are lots of books. Okay, I'm going to give you another one. This is another one our people love to use. The Compact Bible Dictionary. It's got a lot of information. It's got a lot of useful information in it. But it, they have what they call bones. And they love to teach out of this book. All the Israelite camps subscribe to the Zondervan Compact Bible Dictionary, which was written by who? The so-called white man that they say they hate so much. But they'll go and pick this book up and read out of it, but tell you not to read Enoch and tell you not to read Jasher or Jubilees. But I'm going to show you something out of here. And then once this lesson is done, you're going to have to make a decision for yourself. Which one makes the most sense? What's written in the Compact Bible Dictionary? or what is written in the book of Jubilees and the book of Enoch as to what we should be following as far as a calendar. Are we supposed to be following the moon, which is stated in this, or following the sun, which we're gonna go through as you will see in Enoch and Jubilees and so on. So I'm gonna open this up. Um, this is page 98. If you've got a Zondervan Compact Bible Dictionary, you can see I've got it highlighted where it says calendar. All right, this is page 98, Zondervan Compact Bible Dictionary, page 98. It says, during the Bible period, time was reckoned solely on astronomical observations. Days, months, and years were determined by the sun and moon. So you can see already, it's already throwing out confusion. This is being done on purpose because now you can wait. It says days, months, and years were determined by the sun and moon. So how exactly does that work? What is it the, the sun dictates the, the months or is it the moon that dictates the months? Is it the sun that dictates days or is the moon that dictate days? Which one is it? Is it the, the sun that dictates years or is it the moon that dictates the years? There, there is no clear answer in this book. It says days of the week were not named by the Jews, but were designated by ordinal numbers, which is true. The Jewish day began in the evening with the appearance of the first stars. Days were subdivided into hours and watches. The Hebrews divided nights into three watches. The seven-day week is of Semitic origin. Egyptians had a week of 10 days. The Jewish week had its origin in the creation account 
and ran consecutively irrespective of lunar or solar cycles. This was done for man's physical and spiritual welfare. The biblical records are silent regarding the observance of the Sabbath day from creation to the time of Moses. Sabbath observance was either revived or given special emphasis by Moses. All right, so some of this stuff that it's mentioning, we go into the scriptures and show you that the Israelites were given the seven day Sabbath week before we came out of Egypt. Okay, uh, we've gone through that already. Um, the seven day week, we're going to show you how that works because the illuminaries were created on the fourth day, which is why the calendar begins on what would be called Wednesday today, which is the fourth day of the week. The week runs consecutively irrespective, as it's saying here, of the months and the years. Okay. Um, and we're going to show you that. We're not going to go through a whole calendar breakdown. If you want a whole calendar breakdown, go and watch when I seriously recommend you go and watch our videos on the day, the week, the month, and the year. Go watch those four videos. We go very in-depth um, into each of those categories, breaking the calendar up and bringing it out as clear as possible what the Most High expected of us in respect to his calendar. Okay. Um, so now it says the Hebrew month began with the new moon. Before the exile, months were designated by numbers. After the exile, names adopted from the Babylonians were used. Synchronized Jewish sacred calendar, and then first Nisan, Iyar, Sivan, Tammuz, Ab, Elul, Tishri, Heshvan, Kislev, Tibet, Shabbat, and Adar. What you're going to find today is that some of our brothers are still using these names that we adopted from the Babylonians. Okay, which he's going to go into um, in a second, which is where our brothers are going wrong because they're following what's in here. Okay. It says the Jewish calendar had two concurrent years, the sacred year beginning in the spring with the month Nisan and the civic year beginning with Tishri numbered in parentheses above. Now this goes, you have some camps that are teaching that, that there are uh, the years broken up into two six month parts um, in two year intervals, or as you may, as we're reading here, you don't find that in the scriptures. You do not find that in the scriptures at all, okay? It says, uh, beginning with Tishri, numbered in parentheses above. The sacred year was instituted by Moses. It consisted of lunar months of 29 and a half days each with an intercalary month called Adah Shani every three years. Now, do you find that in the book of Moses about the calendar being 29 and a half months each, each month? or 29 and a half days for each month. Is there anywhere in the Torah and the five books of Moses that you find that written? You don't find that written anywhere. Let me read that again. It says the sacred year was instituted by Moses. They're, they're, they're giving Moses credit for this in this book. The sacred year was instituted by Moses and consisted of lunar months of 29 and a half days each. There is nowhere in the scriptures that we're told that a month consists of 29 and a half days. This is a bold-faced lie. It says, with an intercalary month called Adashani every three years. Now they're calling it second Adar. That is not found in the scriptures. That also, or this also, is a lie. You do not find anywhere in the scriptures that we find that every three years there's an intercalary month that is added to the year. Let me read it again. It says, they're saying Moses instituted this. The sacred year was instituted by Moses 
and consisted of lunar months of 29 and a half days each with an intercalary month called Adashinai every three years. Every seventh year was a sabbatical year for the Jews, which you do read about, a year of solemn rest for landlords, slaves, beasts of burden, and land, and freedom for Hebrew slaves. Every 50th year was a jubilee year, observed by family reunions, canceled mortgages, and return of lands to original owners. So this is what the, Con the Zondervan Compact Bible Dictionary has in regards to the calendar. They're saying that Moses instituted a calendar that is of days consisting of each month, 29 and a half days each, each month, and then every three years, a an additional intercalary month, meaning a 13th month being added. Who's following that today? I'm, and this is a question to anybody that watches this video that is a part of the Israelite community or if you're not a part of the so-called Israelite community. Who is following this today? Every camp that says they're following the, the dark moon the sliver moon or the full moon that is following any moon, whether it's the lunar Sabbath, they are following this foolishness where they are adding a 13th month to the year every three years. Some of them are straightforward and they tell you honestly that, yeah, we, we follow this, the month, the second of Dar. They'll tell you flat out. And there are some camps that are hiding it. They don't want you to question them because they know what they're doing is wrong. So what they do is they just put their calendar out every year for their congregations and the congregations never, you know, bat an eyelash. They never question it. They just get the calendar. They're keeping the high holy days. So they think they're keeping the commandments. They show up to uh, Passover. They show up to Feast of First Fruits, Tabernacles, and so on, and think they're keeping the commandments. Following what's written in here, which completely contradicts what is actually written. which we're going to go through okay we have to go back into the past we've got to go back into the days of old to get an understanding of what the most high wanted from us in regards to his calendar here's the question does the moon dictate seasons because all israelite camps understand that our high holy days are based upon the seasons of the year does the moon dictate seasons some of these camp leaders will tell you yeah yes use your common sense does the moon dictate seasons is it the movement of the moon that suddenly spring comes the movement of the moon that summer comes into play and then fall and then winter and then the cycle comes again all based on the cycle of the moon is that how it works even go back to your your junior high or middle school science days where you, where you learned about this stuff even in elementary school is it the moon that dictates seasons or is it the sun? The Bible teaches it's the sun. Our people originally followed the sun until we started following these other, uh, other nations and following after their high holy days and following after their customs. All right. Um, give me one second here.
right, I'm going to share my screen. All right, so I'm I'm gonna I'm going to Chinese New Year first. I'm just gonna pull up a few of them so you get an understanding of what I'm talking of what I'm talking about here. Mm, it's going slow. All right, so we're gonna go to Chinese New Year. It says this is on Wikipedia. You can look this stuff up. You know, very, very easy. It says Chinese New Year is the festival that celebrates the beginning of a new year on the traditional. Now, first, they're calling it a loony solar and solar Chinese calendar. Which one is it? Because that's the same thing. Some of our people teach is that the, the you know, the Israelites followed a loony, a loony solar calendar. This is these are this is all all jargon to create confusion. It says on the traditional loony solar and solar Chinese calendar in Chinese and other East Asian cultures, you get the Mongs, they have Mong New Year, they've got Cambodian New Year, Vietnamese New Year, and they all follow the same thing, in which we're going to show you as we read this paragraph. It says in other East Asian cultures, the festival is common, uh, commonly referred to as the spring festival. As the spring season in the loony solar calendar traditionally starts with Lichen, the first of the 24 solar terms, which the festival celebrates around the time of the Chinese New Year, marking the end of winter and the beginning of the spring season. Observances traditionally take place from New Year's Eve, the evening preceding the first day of the year, to the Lantern Festival held on the 15th day of the year. The first day of the Chinese New Year begins on the new moon that appears between 21 January and 20th February. So what is this telling you? Was it our people following the new moons? Or did we get that from following the other nations? Because when you go into all these other nations calendars, I'm just going to show you Chinese today. We, we don't have that much time. Go and look it up for yourselves. Go and look up all of these different um, New Year's that they celebrate. And you will see that these other nations were the ones that were following the moon, just like Babylon followed the moon. We got this from the other nations, just like we started calling our calendar names the month of the, the months of the year after the Babylonian names. So what we need to do is get into what's written. We've got to stop listening to man and listen to the Most High in regards to the calendar. Like I said, we're not going to do a full breakdown of the calendar today. We don't have enough time. We've got long videos breaking down the calendar. But what we're mostly dealing with today is the fall season is coming up. That, that intercalary day, that fall feast day is coming up this week, along with the memorial blowing of trumpets which is the new month. So we've got the new season coming in and we've got the new month coming in. Okay, so let's go to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 7. <clears throat> the book of Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 7. Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations as thy father, and he will show thee thy elders, and they will tell thee. So we have to remember the days of old. 
We've got to go back into the history and remember the righteous things that our forefathers did. And just as importantly, the wicked things that our forefathers did. The most high, he, he does not hold back. You see what we like to do in Israel um, is we like to sugarcoat things. That's the problem with our people. That's why we're in the situation that we're in now. That's why we're in captivity. Such as like when a person dies. We have this thing where, you know, well, we don't want to talk, you know, ill of the dead. So you never talk about the wicked, evil, bad things that a person did in their life. We glorify people when they die. And that's what happens today in America. Somebody dies and, you know, all of a sudden it's like taboo or something to mention the, the bad things that they've done. Even though they've lived their entire life wickedly. Now, all of a sudden they're being celebrated like a saint. That's what Israel does. But when you go into the scriptures, especially reading the book of Judges, the Most High doesn't hold back. He tells he tells us like it is. Here is Manasseh. He started ruling at the age of such and such on the first day of such and such a month and the first day of you know the year, however he, you know it, it, it will go. And he did not walk in the ways of the Most High. He walked in the ways of wickedness. He did evil in his days. The Most High tells you straight. He doesn't hold back. We've got to we've got to stop this nonsense in Israel. That you know our our forefathers were right. You know these were righteous men. No, they were not righteous all the time. There were some of them that were perfect, but very few. Very few. The Most High is very straightforward in his description of our forefathers, that they were a wicked and perverse generation. In fact, you get that, go to Isaiah 1 and 4. And see how the, the Most High describes his people. Actually start at verse 1 and then read down. The book of Isaiah, chapter 1 and verse 1. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amoth, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, uh, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, king of Judah. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. For the Lord hath spoken, I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's crib. But Israel did not know. My people does not consider. Our people don't even take the time to consider. <laughs> we've learned some of these doctrines from, and like we've you heard of say before, the brothers that started, you know, out in the, the 60s or what have you in the original schools, they didn't have the technology we've got today. So it's a given that they made some mistakes. We, we understand that. But we also got to make clear that there was some wicked men among them brothers. Some very wicked men that came out of them original schools. That came from under those teachings. Men that started calling themselves the, the God sent comforter. Men that started telling saying that they're the third in line to Christ. Men walking around talking about their uh, their King David uh, back in the flesh, reincarnated. Men walking around making all kind of false prophecies and things like that. There, there is a lot of wicked men that came out of those original schools. Just like our forefathers back in that day were wicked. That's why he tells Deuteronomy 32 and 7. Remember the days of old, consider the years of many generations. Ask thy father and he will show thee thy elders and they will tell thee. We've got to tell our people the truth. We've got to stop lying to our people. Let's see what the Most High says next. Read on. Verse 4. A sinful nation 
a sinful nation, read. A people laden with iniquity. A people that's full of iniquity, read. A seed of evildoers. A what? A seed of evildoers. He says we're a seed of evildoers, read. Children that are corruptors. Children that are corruptors, read. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. We've provoked him unto anger. Provoked him unto anger. Is that it on it? They are gone away backwards. Oh, yeah. They are gone away backwards. We've gone way backwards, especially when it comes to the calendar and following the high holy days. We've gone way backwards. And our people don't want to make the corrections that are needed. There are some corrections that need to be made in Israel. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 8 and 1. You're going to read through verse 20. The book of uh, the book of Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 1. It says, all the commandments which I command thee this day shall ye observe to do, that ye may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord uh, swear unto your fathers. So before we went into the land, we were commanded to do all of his commandments. Not some of them, not rehearse the righteous acts, because some of you are taking that uh, precept way out of context. Oh, well, right now, you know, we're, we're just rehearsing the righteous acts. You know what I mean? We got to stop doing that. We have got to stop making excuses and giving our people a crutch to lean on when it comes to keeping the commandments. Go ahead and read. It says, and, and thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness. To humble thee and to provoke thee, to know to thee and to prove thee, and to prove thee to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. See, our people fail to understand that the Most High is always testing us. We're being tested right now. And our people, as even though we're waking up, everybody's, you know, excited because Israel's waking up. What good does it do it if our people wake up into wickedness? We're waking up and remaining just as wicked as we were before we woke up. What good is that doing? It's not helping us. Go ahead and read. And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna, which thou knowest not, neither did thy fathers know that he might make thee known that make thee known that man does not live by bread by bread only but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of the lord does man live and you can go read about that because that's what christ is quoting in the book of matthew chapter 4 go ahead and read thy raiment waxed not old upon thee Neither did thy foot swell uh, these forty years. Thou shalt also consider in thine heart that as a man chast chasteneth his son, so the Lord thy God chasteneth thee. And that's what's happening to us right now. As a man chasteneth his son, the Lord is chastening us right now as we're here in America. We are getting our butt whooping for not listening. Go ahead and read. Therefore, thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways and to fear him. For the Lord thy God bringeth thee into a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains of depths that spring out of val valleys and hills, and land of wheat and barley and vines and fig, fig trees and pomegranates and lands of oil, oil, olive, and honey, a land wherein thou shalt eat bread without uh, scareness, thou shalt not lack anything in it, a land whose uh, stones are an iron, and out of whose hills thou mayest dig brass. When thou hast eaten 
and art full, then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land which which he had given thee. So we're being warned now. When thou hast eaten and art full, then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he hath given thee. Because this goes into commandment three. If you've watched our video on commandment three, this is how we've taken the Lord's name in vain. One of the ways. Go ahead and read. Verse 11. Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God into keeping his commandments not and his judgment. keeping and not keeping his commandments. Beware that thou forgettest not the Lord thy God in not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes, which I command thee this day. So Let he warned us, don't forget about me. Because that's what Israel does. We forget about as soon as we got everything we want. We're living fat. Our pockets are full. You know what I mean? We got food. We got water. We got drink. Everything we need in this life then we forget all about the most high breaking commandment three. Go ahead and read. Lest when thou hast eaten and art full and has built good, goodly home ho houses and dwelt therein. And when thy uh, herds and thy flocks multiply and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied and all that thou hast in has is multiplied. So he's warning us when everything that we have gets multiplied, he's adding to it and adding to it. What is he warning us? Read. Then thine heart be lifted up and thou forget the Lord thy God. That's happening today in America. The Most High blesses our people with homes, cars, jewelry, good occupations. Kids are going to better schools now. And the higher up in American society our people get, the more they forget about who? The Most High. Go ahead and read. Which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, who led thee through that great and terrible wilderness, wherein were fiery serpents and scorpions, oh, fiery, serpents. fiery serpents and scorpions and drought, and drought, where there was no water, who brought thee forth water out of the rock of Flint, who fed thee in the wilderness with manna, which thy fathers knew not, that he might humble thee and that he might prove thee to do thee good at thy latter end. And thou say in thine heart, my power and the might of mine hand had gotten me this wealth. Because that's what Israel does. I did this. I'm the one that did this. I did this myself. And I understand where that's coming because that was my attitude at one point. I was always like, you know what, man? I'm the one that got up at five and six o'clock in the morning going out training hours and hours and in on day, you know, days and going out and working hard. And that was my attitude and, you know, in my accomplishments. Until I woke up and realized, you know what? I was completely wrong. Go ahead and read. Verse 18. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant which he swore unto thy fathers as it is this day. And it shall be, if thou do at all forget the Lord thy God, and walk after other gods, and serve them, and worship them, I testify against you this day that ye shall surely perish. And ye shall surely perish. And are we perishing? Yes, we are. Go ahead and read. As the nations which the Lord destroyed before your face, so shall ye perish, because ye will not be obedient unto the voice of the Lord your God. And we're seeing it happening day in and day out that there are people in Israel that are dying left and right. You're seeing in a lot of these camps, people are just, you know, just dying left and right. You got to ask yourself why. Because in the majority of these camps, the commandments are not being kept. 
they are not keeping the command, no matter how much they sit up here on, on YouTube, read scriptures, and tell you keep the commandments, they are not doing it themselves. You got a lot of modern day Pharisees, Sadducees, and scribes and lawyers running through Israel today that are, are leading Israel astray. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 9 and 1 through 29. The book of Deuteronomy chapter 9 and verse 1. Hear, O Israel, thou art, thou, art, thou art to pass over Jordan this day, to go in to possess nations greater and mightier than thyself, cities great and fenced up to heaven. A so people let's, let's stop right there for one second, because a lot of our people always go back to uh, Genesis 25 when it comes to Esau and make the mistake of saying that, see, we, we're stronger than Esau. We, and misreading what is being said. What's being said in Genesis 25 is that Esau was stronger than Jacob. And it's, and that theme holds true throughout the scriptures that the Edomites and all the other nations were stronger than us. And he constantly reminds us of that. And this is in the one of the precepts that he reminds us of this. Hear, O Israel, thou art to pass over Jordan this day, to go in to possess nations greater and mightier than thyself, cities great and fenced up to heaven. So we've got to stop lying to our people and stop, you know, misquoting or misreading scriptures or taking them out of context. All right, go ahead and read on. Wasn't Jacob scared of Esau when he was trying to come back, even yeah, giving exactly. him gifts? Exactly. So if if he was scared of him. If he was stronger than him, why would he be scared of him? Exactly. That, that, that's a good point. That, that's absolutely true. Actually, um, let's, let's go to Genesis 25 real quick, so, so people understand what we're talking about. Start right at 25. Or actually start at um, verse 22. 22. The book of Genesis, chapter 25 and verse 22. And the children struggled together within her. And she said, if it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said unto her, two nations are in thy womb. And two manner of people shall be uh, separate from thy bowels. And the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall be shall serve the younger. So when it comes to this, our people say, see, we were stronger than them. Jacob was stronger than Esau. That's not what it's saying. The subject matter, when you get to, and the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder, because the subject matter in this sentence is the same subject in this sentence, the elder, the elder says, and the one people, meaning the people that comes out of the elder says, and the one people shall be stronger than the other people. And meaning in addition to those one people being stronger and those one people is talking about who? The elder and the elder shall serve the younger. He's telling us that Esau was stronger than Jacob. Esau was the one out there in the field hunting and running around in the. We, I'm telling our people, we go out into the wilderness and you hear a, a tree branch break and we're out there scared. Right. <laughs> it, it, it's, I'm serious. It's funny, though, because our people, you hear, you see them, they go out to camp and they pull Genesis 25, 23 and see Esau, was, we, we were stronger than Esau. That's not what it's saying. That's just a, another situation where we were taught wrong by some of the elders. And we've got to make these corrections. So um, let's go back where we were, back to uh, Deuteronomy 9. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 9 and verse, we were two. verse 2. A people great and tall, the children of Anakims, 
who thou knowest and of, of whom thou hast heard say, who can stand before the children of Anak? Even though some there are some of our brothers that try and sit there and say, there was no giants in the, what, who do you think he's talking about right here? A people great and tall, the children of the Anakims. I'm not going to go into that right now of who these people are. But you read about them in the book of Jasher. You read about them in the book of Enoch. But go ahead and read. It says, understand, therefore, this day that the Lord thy God is he which goeth over before thee. As a consuming fire, he shall destroy them, and he shall bring them down before thy face. So shall thou drive them out. And destroy them quickly as the Lord had said unto thee. So we were told that we are supposed to destroy these nations. Go ahead and read. Speak not thou in thine heart. After that the Lord thy God had cast them out from before thee. Saying for my righteousness the Lord had brought me in to possess, uh, in to possess this land. But for the wickedness of these nations the Lord doth drive them out from before thee. And it's the same thing today. It's not going to be because of our righteousness. It should be because of our righteousness that he will destroy America. But he's going to destroy America because of the wickedness of America. Just like he did back then. Go ahead and read. Not for thy righteousness or for the uh, uprightness of thine heart. Does thou go to possess their land? But for the wickedness of these nations, the Lord, thy God, doth drive them out from before thee, and that he may perform the word which the Lord uh, sweareth unto thy fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Understand, therefore, that the Lord thy God giveth thee not this good land to possess it for thy righteousness, for thou art a stiff-necked people. He straight up, for thou art a stiff-necked people. Read. Verse 7. Remember and forget not how thou provokest the Lord thy God to wrath in the wilderness from the days that thou didst depart out of the land of Egypt. Until ye come unto this place, ye have been rebellious against the Lord. And here we are thousands of years later, and we're still just as rebellious. Go ahead and read. Also, in Horeb, ye provoked the Lord to wrath, so that the Lord was angry with you to have destroyed you. When I was gone up into the mount to receive the tables of stone, even the tables of the covenant which the Lord made with you. Then I abode in the mount forty days and forty nights. I neither did eat bread nor drink water. And the Lord delivered uh, unto me two tables of stone written with the finger of God. And on them was written according to all the words which the Lord spake with you in the mount of mount out of the midst of the fire in the days of assembly. Of the assembly. And it came to pass at the end of the of 40 days and 40 nights that the Lord gave me the two ta tablets of stone, even tables of the covenant. And the Lord said unto me, Arise, get thee down quickly from hence, for thy people which thou hast brought forth out of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They are quick, quickly turned aside out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten image. Look at how quickly our people will turn aside from the commandments. It doesn't take much. It does not take much for Israel to just completely throw the commandments aside and start doing what they want to do. The, the Israelite awakening, I want to say started, started full head of steam, probably somewhere around 2014, 2013, maybe full steam ahead. And it, it's been growing as the Israelite community has been growing at a exponential rate ever since. Not saying that's where it started. I'm saying that the big growth spurt where the Israelites just started waking up, waking up, waking up, waking up, waking up, waking up. And look at how quickly we've gone aside from keeping the commandments. Look at how quickly 
some of these camps and camp leaders have become corrupted. Some of the ones that were here before then, they, they were already corrupt. But look at some of the new ones, the new camps and organizations that are popping up within these years. How quickly they go aside from keeping the commandments and keeping what is written in the scriptures. And it's a continuous cycle with our people. Go ahead and read. Uh, verse 13. Furthermore, the Lord spake unto me, saying, I have seen these people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Reiterating what he said before. He's always repeating himself. Go ahead. Let me alone, that I may destroy them and blot out their name from under heaven, and I will make of thee a nation mightier and greater than they. So here it is. The Most Highest telling Moses, you know what? I'm tired of these people. Get out of the way so I can just destroy them. Let me blot their name out. We're lucky that we as Israel are even here. Because imagine at this day and time, all it would have taken Moses to say, you know what, Lord, you're right. They will not listen. Kill them all and give me a wife that I can make a whole new nation from. Because that's what he was offering Moses. I'll create a, a whole better nation, a greater, mightier, and greater nation coming from you. And Moses said what? Read on. Verse uh, 15. So I turned and came down from the mountain, and the, and the mountain burned with fire. And the two tables of covenant were in my two hands. And I looked, behold, ye had sinned against the Lord your God and had made you a molten calf. Ye had turned aside quickly out of the way which the Lord had commanded you. And I took the two tables and cast them out of my two hands and break them before your eyes. And I fell down before the Lord as at, at the first. Forty days and forty nights I did neither eat bread nor drink water, because of all your sins which ye sinned, in doing wickedly in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. So the reason why Moses fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, it wasn't for his benefit. He did that for ours. He did it because of our sins to atone for the sins of the people because they had become so wicked. But a lot of our brothers fail to teach this or mention this when they read the scriptures. Go ahead and read. Verse 19, for I was afraid of the anger and hot displeasure wherewith the Lord was brought against you to destroy you. But the Lord hearkened unto me at that time also. So the Lord was ready to destroy us. But uh, all praises to the Most High then to that our forefather Moses intervened and that he listened to Moses. Go ahead. And the Lord was very angry with Aaron to have destroyed him. And I prayed for Aaron also the same time. He also prayed for Aaron. So he prayed, he fasted and he prayed for our people. And he prayed for Aaron also because Aaron was going to get destroyed, his own brother. Go ahead and read. And I took your sin, the calf which he had made, and, the bur and burnt, it, burnt it with fire. And stamped it and ground it very small, even until it was as small as dust. And I cast the dust thereof into the brook that descended out of the mount. And at ta Tabra, what is that? And Tabra. Tabra and at Masha and at Ki Kibroth, Kibrahatavaha. Kibrahatavan. That was long. <laughs> Hey. Brought ha to ha -aban, to ha right. Um, it says, You provoke the Lord to breath. Likewise, when the Lord sent you from Kadesh Bar -ne -ne saying, Go up and possess the land which I have given you, then ye rebelled against the commandments of the Lord your God, and ye believe him not, nor hearken unto his voice. Ye have been rebellious against the Lord from the day that I knew uh, that I knew you. Thus I fell down uh, before the Lord forty days and forty nights, as I fell down at the first. 
because the Lord had said he would destroy you. So he went back another 40 days and 40 nights and fasted again and prayed. Go ahead and read. I prayed therefore unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, destroy not thy people and thy inheritance, which thou hast redeemed through thy greatness, which thou hast brought forth out of the Egypt with a mighty hand. Remember thy servant Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Look not unto the stubbornness of this people, nor their wickedness, nor to their sin. Lest the land whence thou broughtest us unto I'm going to read that again. Lest the land whence thou broughtest us out say, because the Lord was not able to bring them into the land which he promised them, and because he hated them, he had brought them out to slay them in the wilderness. Yet they are thy people and thy inheritance, which thou broughtest out of out by the mighty, mighty power of mighty power and by thy stretched out arm. So if it wasn't for Moses intervening, the Most High would have destroyed Israel back then. And we have the nerves today in 2022 to still be just as stiff necked and rebellious as our forefathers were back then. That's why we have to remember the days of old. We've got to consider the many years of the, the many years of the many generations of, and the days of old. We've got to think back on those days. We've got to go back into the history and remember that our forefathers went completely off and we're suffering for it today. And instead of trying to do better, we're doing worse. Let's go to Psalm 77, 11 through 12. The book of Psalms, chapter 77 and verse 11. I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember thy wonder, wonders of old. I will meditate also all thy works and talk of thy doings. In other words, rehearse the righteous act of the Lord. Talking about them, repeating them, speaking of them. Talk of his doings. Not what some of our brothers are saying, oh, rehearse the, well, we, we got to rehearse the righteous acts. We've got to do better, Israel. We keep giving our people a crutch. We keep giving our people excuses to break the commandments. People may ask a, a, a leader, you know, they're teaching online. Uh, well, you know, how come you guys... Uh, Feast day is different than other camp feast days. Like, uh, <laughs> you know, brother, we're just here to rehearse the righteous acts. You know what I'm saying, brother? That, that's not what he told us to do. That's not what that precept is telling us. Rehearse the righteous acts. We got to rehearse the righteous acts, you know, until Christ comes. It, it's crazy. Let's go to Psalms 105 and 1 through 6. The book of Psalms, uh, chapter 105 and verse 1, it says, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the people. Sing unto him, sing, sing a psalm unto him. Talk ye of all his wondrous works. Glory ye in his holy name. Let the heart of them rejoice that seek the Lord. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face evermore. Remember his marvelous works that he had done, his wonders and the judgment of his mouth. O ye seed of Abraham, his servant, ye children of Jacob, his chosen. So he's telling us, O give thanks unto the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the people. That's what it means to rehearse the righteous acts. It's not talking about what has been going around Israel all these years that, you know, we've got to rehearse the righteous acts. You know, we have, we're, we're, we're not following the calendar perfectly. Or, you know, people may say, well, why are you guys um, adding a 13th month? 
oh, you know, right now you see we're in captivity where we can't keep our high holy days the way we're supposed to. So, you know, we're, we're just here to rehearse the righteous acts. That's the excuse for adding a 13th month to the calendar. Let's go to Judges 5 and 11. We're going to go through this real quick to clear up what Judges 5 and 11 is talking about. Again, we've done this. Boy, this is going to be like our third time going through this. We, we've done this a few times already because this is where some of these guys will go. And they quote it all the time. Well, brother, we're, we're rehearsing the righteous acts. So read it when you got it. The book of Judges, chapter 5 and verse 11. It says, they that are delivered from the uh, noise of archers in the place of drying water, there shall they rehearse the righteous acts of the Lord, even the righteous acts towards the inhabitants of his village in Israel. Then shall the people of the Lord go down to the gates. So let's read this again. They that are delivered from the noise of archers in the places of drawing water, there shall they rehearse the righteous acts of the Lord, even the righteous acts toward the inhabitants of his villages in Israel. We're supposed to rehearse his righteous acts towards us, meaning speak about them, talk about them, Repeat them to the coming generations. We'll give you precepts to prove that that's what it's talking about. Go to Exodus 17, 14. These, this is not in the lesson. I'm just going through this on the fly because our people need to stop using this as a crutch. The book of Exodus chapter 17 and verse 14. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book and re rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. For I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. So when he says and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, what does he mean by that? Speak it. Repeat it. Tell Joshua what I said. Isn't that what he's talking about? Is he talking about rehearsing the righteous acts? You know, like, like it's a stage play and this is a dress rehearsal. That's not what this is. Go to a first Samuel eight and 21. The book of first Samuel chapter eight and verse 21. And Samuel heard all the words of the people. And he rehearsed them in the ears of the Lord. And Samuel heard all the words of the people, and he rehearsed them in the ears of the Lord. In other words, he repeated what the people said in the ears of the Lord. Spoke, speak, talking, words. Go to uh, 17 and 31 of 1 Samuel. First uh, Samuel seven, chapter 17 and verse 31. It says, And when the words were heard with Dave, which David spake, they rehearsed him before Saul, and he sent for him. And when the words were heard, heard which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul, and he sent for him. In other words, what David spoke, they went and rehearsed it, repeated it to Saul. They went and told Saul what David said. It's crazy that we got to go through this. Go to Isaiah uh, 63 and 7 through 11. I'm serious. It's, it's a shame that we actually have to go and, and go through these things just to clear up some of this confusion in Israel. Um, 63, 7, and 11? Yeah, 63 and 7 through 11. The book of Isaiah, chapter 63 and verse 7. I will mention the loving kindness of the Lord 
and the what praises say, of the I will do what? I will mention I, the loving kindnesses of the Lord. Read. I will mention the loving kindnesses of the Lord and the uh, praise of the Lord according to all that the Lord had bestowed on us. All and the that according to all that the Lord had bestowed on us. We're supposed to rehearse and repeat all the things that he did for us. Read. And the great goodness towards the house of Israel, which he had bestowed on them according to his mercies and according to the multitude of his loving kindness. For he said, surely they are my people, children that will not that will not lie. So he was their savior in all their affliction. He was afflicted and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them and he bared them and carried them all the days of old. But they rebelled and vexed his Holy Spirit. Therefore, he was turned to be their enemy and he fought against them. Then he remembered the days of old. Moses and his people saying, where is that? Where is he? That brought them up out of the sea, which the shepherds of his flock, where is he that put his Holy Spirit within him? So you can see this is doing exactly what we're commanded to do, to rehearse the righteous acts, to mention, to speak about, to repeat all of the things, the great goodness that he did toward the house of Israel. That's what Judges 5 and 11 is talking about. Go to um, Acts 11 and 4. Get a few more. Go into the New Testament. The book of Acts chapter 11 and verse 4. But Peter, re but Peter rehearsed the matter from the beginning and expounded it by order unto them, saying. So how did he rehearse it? It says, but Peter rehearsed the matter from the beginning and expounded it by order unto them. So he went from the beginning in order unto the end of what he had to say. How did he rehearse it? Saying. But Peter rehearsed the matter from the beginning, expounded it by order unto them, saying, speaking. Go to Acts 14.27. Uh, the book of Acts, chapter 14 and verse 27. Uh, and when they were come and had gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them. And how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. So it says, and when they were come and had gathered the church together, they rehearsed. In other words, they spoke, they repeated, mentioned all that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith into the Gentiles. That's what it means to rehearse. Go to 1 Samuel 12 and 7. The book of 1 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 7. Now therefore stand still that I may reason with you before the Lord of all the righteousness acts of the lord which he did to you and to your fathers so what is he doing here he's speaking he's telling them he's gonna repeat all the things that the most high the righteous acts the lord did to our people and to our forefathers now therefore stand still that i may reason with you before the lord of all the righteous acts of the lord that's what it's talking about rehearse the righteous acts it's not talking about the reason why we're not keeping the high holy days the way we're supposed to because oh, we're just rehearsing the righteous acts. Why are you keeping the dark moon? Well, you know, some are keeping the sliver moon. Well, some are keeping the full moon. Well, you know, we're, we're, we're as long as we rehearse the righteous acts. It's an excuse that we're using that is not valid. Uh, go to Sirach 19 and 7. This will be the last one. The 
the book of Ecclesiasticus, chapter 19 and verse 7. Rehearse not unto another that which is told unto thee, and thou shalt fare never the worse. So rehearse not unto another that which is told unto thee. How would you rehearse? Somebody tells you something. How would you rehearse it? Read the next verse, verse 8. Verse 8. Whether it be to friend or foe, talk not of other men's lives. And if thou canst without offense, reveal them not. So how would you rehearse what another has told thee? By talking about it, whether it be to friend or foe, talk not of other men's lives. In other words, don't rehearse of other men's lives. Rehearse not unto another that which is told unto thee, and thou shalt fare never the worse. Whether it be to friend or foe, talk not of other men's lives, and if thou canst without offense, reveal them not. So this is talking about rehearsing. It's, talk, it's talking. It's speaking. Our people have got to understand this. We've got to. Um, let's go to the book of first Samuel 24 and 13. The book of first Samuel chapter 24 and verse 13. I said the Proverbs. Oh, 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 hold on, hold on. Don't, don't read it yet. Don't read it yet. Don't read it yet. Um, so before we, before we get to that, um, I just want to make clear that we understand that rehearsing the righteous acts is not talking about using that as an excuse or using Judges 5 and 11 as an excuse for us breaking the commandments or not keeping high holy days the way we're supposed to. He makes it clear in the scriptures how we are supposed to follow the calendar how we're supposed to follow the high holy days. The problem with Israel is Israel chooses to do what Israel wants to do and follow the other nations. And it's a sad thing. When the books tells us by going precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little and there a little, how we are supposed to keep the high holy days. Here a little bit in the Old Testament, there a little bit in Jubilees, here a little bit in Enoch, here a little bit in the the um, the Apocrypha, here a little and there a little to get the full understanding of the calendar and how we're supposed to keep the High Holy Days. But our people always let men always follow men and let men lead us astray and we've got to stop so basically what we're going to show real quick is just that these books are mentioned in the scriptures so i actually posed a question was it two weeks ago about first samuel 24 and 13. all right go ahead and go to first samuel 24 and 13 and read it when you got it the book of first samuel chapter 24 and verse 13. as said the proverb of the ancients wickedness proceedeth from the wicked wicked but my hand shall not be upon thee so the uh book of first samuel chapter 24 and 13 as saith the proverb of the ancients, wickedness proceeded from the wicked, but mine hand shall not be upon thee. Who was speaking here? This was King David talking to, to I mean, this was, well, he wasn't king at the time, but this was David speaking to King Saul about the fact that he could have killed him. But he says, but mine hand shall not be upon thee. But he's quoting a proverb of the ancients. When you go to the book of Proverbs, you don't find this proverb anywhere in the book of Proverbs. As saith the proverb of the ancients. In other words, as saith the, the sayings of the words of the ancients. 
wickedness proceeded from the wicked. What is he quoting? What is David quoting? I, I posed that question two weeks ago and nobody answered. There's one group that went and did a whole lesson talking about the book of the Apocrypha and how the book of the Apocrypha is valid and then went on to try to chastise people that read the book of Enoch and read the book of Jasher and these other books. Obviously, Now it's known, the, the, the cat's been let, let out of the bag, that the majority of you in Israel haven't even read the Bible. Some of the leaders in Israel haven't even read the Bible in its, in its entirety. So, which lets me know that you're making fun of books, of Jasher, Enoch, that some of you haven't even written, that you haven't even read them. So you don't even know what's in these books. Why? Because you've been going by listening to some of these leaders that say, oh, man, you, you reading them books or they re they're reading them books. Stay away from them books. Them books is garbage. The white man wrote them books. So you don't want to get ostracized by the people in your camp or by your camp leader. You don't want to get stood up in the front of everybody and made fun of and chastised for reading somebody, you know, one of the people from the camp comes over and visit your house and they see you've got the book of Enoch sitting there and they'll go to the camp leader and be like, man, you know, we was, you know, at so-and-so's house for the new moon, uh, they had the book of Jasher sitting there on, or they had the book of Enoch laying out on their desk. And then there's a whole inquisition made. Okay, call them. Hey, you know what? You got to come in. We, we need to sit down and talk. They come in. What's going on? Well, we, we, we're hearing you're reading Enoch. They're like, oh, um, like, what are you talking about? Well, it was told to us that you got the book of Enoch at home and you've been reading the book of Enoch. Now you got to stand in front of the leadership of your camp and explain to them why you're reading this book. Well, um, I, 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 I was just, uh, you know, curious to, to see what it said. You know, I didn't mean, bro, you're suspended. You can't come to camp for a whole month. In fact, we're reducing your rank from officer to soldier. Or if we're, we're reducing you from officer to brother, you, you can't even, we, you, we're taking your rank, period. That's what's going on in these camps. Simply because somebody possesses one of these books. We're going to show you that this is foolishness. What was David quoting in 1 Samuel 24 and 13? the proverb of these ancients where do you go to find this quote right here in the book of jasher i'm gonna go to it this is the book of jasher chapter 7 and verse 48 it's, it reads it says and everyone that heard of the acts of mardon the son of nimrod would say concerning him from the wicked goeth forth wickedness. Therefore, it became a proverb in the whole earth, saying, From the wicked goeth forth wickedness. And it was current in the words of men from that time to this. So this was being spoke of in regards to the son of Nimrod. One of his sons by the name of Mardan. He was so wicked and the deeds that he committed were so wicked that this became a proverb. A proverb that our forefathers knew and that David himself is repeating. Straight out of the book of Jasher. But they will sit there and tell you that the book of Jasher is garbage. Explain that.
again, it is what it is. What did I just read? The book of Jasher, chapter 7 and verse 48 is what David is quoting in 1 Samuel 24 and 13. Read verse Samuel 24 and 13. Uh, first Samuel 24 and 13 says, uh, as saith the proverb of the ancients, wickedness proceedeth from the wicked, but my hand shall not be upon thee. What was he quoting? Jasher 7 and 48. And everyone that heard of the acts of Mardon, the son of Nimrod, would say concerning him, from the wicked goeth forth wickedness. Therefore, it became a proverb in the whole earth, saying, From the wicked goeth forth wickedness. And it was current in the words of men from that time to this. So am I going to believe David in that the book of Jasher was good enough for him to quote? Or am I going to listen to our brothers today that are speaking out of foolishness and ignorance? That are they they uh well how does that go is that in Jude? Let, let me grab that real quick. Let's go to let, let me find it first. Let me go to Jude. I don't want to misquote it. Jude one. Um. um, um Hmm. No, I don't think that's where it's at. No, 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 here it is. Yeah, yeah, here it is. Jude 1 and 10. Yeah, Jude chapter 1, verse 10. It's the only chapter in Jude. Uh, Jude 1 and 10. It says, uh, but these speak evil of those things which they know not. But what they know naturally as brute beasts in those things, they corrupt themselves. So that's heavy. It says, but these speak evil of those things which they know not. And that's what we see happening when it comes to the book of Jasher, the book of Enoch and Jubilees and some of the other books that were taken out. And so on. Some of these camps, camp leaders, teachers in Israel, they will speak evil of these things, which they have no understanding of. Some of these guys have never even read them. Some of them have never even read the Bible, which we're finding out now, which makes you scratch your head and say, okay, no wonder some of these uh, uh, doctrines and teachings have crept up into Israel because they're just going by what they've been told and what they've been taught and haven't gone and researched and read and studied and, and learned for themselves. Go to 2 Peter 2 and 12 because he says the same thing here. The book of 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 12. But these, as natural brute bees made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things that they understand not and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. They're going to utterly perish in their own corruption. Why? Is Because they're following the moon. When we were clearly told not to. And they speak evil of the books that they have no understanding of because they haven't read them. And they haven't, you know, and apparently they haven't even read the Bible. It, it is what it is. David is quoting Jasher. Let's go to Joshua 10 and 13. 
Are we going to listen to man? Or are we going to listen to the scriptures? Joshua 10, 13. Yes. The book of Joshua, chapter 10 and verse 13. And the, and the sun stood still and the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is not this written in the book of Jasher? Read that again. Is is not this written in the book of Jasher? Is not this written in the book of Jasher? Is not this written in the book of Jasher? Read on. So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and hasted not to go down about a whole day. So where do you read this at? In the book of Jasher, chapter 89 and verse 8. But they tell you don't read Jasher. The white man wrote that. Go to 2 Samuel 1 and 18. The book of 2 Samuel, chapter 1 and verse 18. It says, also, he bade them uh, teach the children of Judah the use of the, the bow. Behold, it is written in the book of Jasher. Behold, it is written in the book of what? Jasher. In the book of Jasher. Where is it written? You could go and read this about this same incident in the book of Jasher, chapter 56 and verse 8. So, and this is on world. I'm just going to give you these three. That the book of Jasher is clearly mentioned in the scriptures. David is clearly quoting the book of Jasher. So it is what it is. You can, you can keep listening to these men or you can listen to the scriptures to get understanding. Because the understanding that you're getting from men is leading you astray. What about Enoch? Let's go to the book of Jude, chapter 1, and verse 14 through 15. We're going to get just a, from a few of the books so we can, before we get into it, that Jasher is in the scriptures. Enoch is in the scriptures. Okay. So Jude chapter 1 and verse 14 through 15. The book of Jude uh, 1 and 14. And Enoch, and Enoch also, the seven from Adam, prophesied of thee, saying, Behold, the Lord coming with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodliness, which they have ungodly committed and of all their, their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. What is Jude quoting here in Jude chapter one and verse 14 and Enoch also the seventh from Adam prophesied of these saying he's quoting directly from Enoch's prophecies. Where are those prophecies found? In the book of Enoch, chapter one and verse nine, which I'm about to read to you right now. This is the book of Enoch, chapter one and verse nine. And behold, he cometh with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all and to destroy all the ungodly and to convict all flesh of all the works of their ungodliness, which they have ungodly committed, and of all the hard things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Isn't that what we just read in Jude 1 and 14 through 15? And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. But they're going to tell you, oh, the book of book of Enoch, you're reading that book? So who are you going to listen to? 
Are we going to listen to the words of the Most High, which is coming straight from our forefathers? Or are you going to keep listening to men that are leading you astray? Don't listen to us. Go read it for yourselves. Go and read it for yourselves. And again, ask yourself the simple question. Does the moon dictate seasons? The spring, se I mean, not the spring, the fall season is coming upon us. And let me fix this because I put, <laughs> I put the spring. Correct that. The fall season is coming upon us. So we're going to get into this. Um, give me one second. Do you, do you have um, uh, Jubilees? You, you don't have them? Not on me, no. Okay. Uh, I, I'll read it. Give me one second. Are we going to read more so I can ask for it? Yeah, yeah. Because we're going to be reading out of um, Enoch, Jubilees, and Jasher. Trying to find some real quick because I uh Just give us a second, you guys. Hold hold fast. Just give us a second. You said uh, the Book of Jubilee and what other book? Uh, Enoch. Oh, that one I got. Yeah. And Jasher. Jasher. So we're going to be going into the fall season. Um, so as we said before, we're not going to go 
fully into in depth into the calendar. That's not what this lesson is about. It's just to give you a uh, understanding that these uh, holy days are coming up this this week. Give you a rundown of, of what these uh, uh, holy days are, why we keep them. And it's because we're commanded to. All right. So the fall is coming up. Let me correct that. Because I'm sorry, I put spring by accident. Um, and I just caught it just before we, just right now. So it's going to be fall season coming in. And you read about these, uh, these days there are four what's called intercalary days that are mentioned in the scriptures, okay? These intercalary days are part of the 364-day cycle. They're, uh, the days, it's 360 days with the four intercalary days making a 364 year, I mean, day cycle for the year. Esau understood this. Esau understood our calendar. They mimicked the calendar. They have us following the moon, following behind the other nations while they somewhat took our calendar and somewhat revised it making it a 365-day calendar instead of a 364-day calendar. As you read about in Daniel 7, was that Daniel 7 and 25? Um, Daniel 7. Yeah, go to Daniel 7 and 25 real quick. Because our people will go to Daniel 7 and 25 and say, see, they, they, they completely changed it. We followed the moon. No, they tricked you into believing we followed the moon. Right. Uh, the book of Daniel. Give me a second. So Daniel 7, 27, 25? 25, yeah. Okay, the book of Daniel, chapter seven and verse twenty-five, and he shall, uh, <clears throat> and he shall uh, speak great words against the ma the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand unto a time, and time, and the division of time, and the dividing of time. So he's telling us. And shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think and think to change times and laws. They made subtle changes. See, the best way to trick a per to trick a people, you don't have to completely make changes. It's just making that 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 cloud of confusion to where they they go away from keeping their laws and commandments but you don't have to completely change them and give them something different and now they think that what you've done what you're keeping is the wrong thing which in fact what we are keeping is wrong by following the moon esau's calendar is almost spot on with subtle changes They've got the week right, the seven-day week, they've got it right. The months and years being followed by the sun is correct. What they've done is they've subtly changed the day of the year. They added 300, they added an extra day. Instead of 364, they added a day making it 365. Instead of the first day of the month, the first day of the year, starting on the fourth day of the work week, 
it just starts any day because of their 365 day calendar. They've changed the holidays. They went, they, they don't hold to the most highs, high holy days. They've gone to Christmas, Halloween, Thanksgiving, Valentine's Day, Easter, and so on. They've made changes, but subtle changes. They understand that the seasons are dictated by the sun and not by the moon, which they got the understanding from us. Because they were following the moon at one point in time. When you go back to the Greeks, they were, they were following everything. They were following the stars. They are following the sun. They're following the moon. They are following, they are all kinds of crazy stuff all the different gods and goddesses that the Greeks were following. So we're going to go to the Book of Jubilees. And what we're going to find is that it is written right here in these books that we would go off following the moon. We were warned about it. Now, wouldn't it how would I put this? I, I'm trying. I'm trying to be. Um, I, I don't want to say it in a wrong way that makes it seem like we're we're trying to make fun of people for doing this, right? But there's no other way you could put it. Who are you going to listen to? Are you going to listen to some of these leaders in Israel that have over and over again made? prophecies that didn't come true? Or are you going to listen to our forefathers that wrote in the books a prophecy, a straightforward prophecy that in the latter days we would be following the moon and going off in our following of the seasons and the high holy days? Which one are you going to follow? Some of our brothers in the truth that have come up with prophecies about the, the, the uh, Messiah coming back in the year 2000. The prophecy didn't come true. You had people saying that he was going to come back in the year 2019. The prophecy didn't come true. You had some saying that the earth was going to get destroyed in 2012. And that Christ was coming back in 2012. The prophecy didn't come true. You have some saying that the mark of the beast is the computer chip. And that from that mark is going to be the, the countdown to Christ coming back. There, there, the RFI, the RFID chip has been around for a long time. Are people being forced to get an RFID chip in them? No. You've got an RFID chip on your credit card, on your debit card. The RFID chip has been around for a minute now. People are getting RFID chips put into their dogs and cats. But you have people that have made these prophecies and they haven't come true. But we're going to read about prophecies that were given to us by our forefathers written in those same books. They tell you not to read that have absolutely come true. So we're going to go to the book of Jubilees, chapter 6, and you're going to read verses 23 through 38. Did you have Jubilees? No, sorry, I said I'll read it. I'll read it. I'll read it. I got Jubilees. You got it? Okay. All right. Go yeah. ahead. Uh, call it again. Uh, Jubilees, chapter 6, and verse 23. 
where it says, and on the new moon of the first month, and on the new moon of the fourth month, and on the new moon of the seventh month? All right. The book of Jubilees, chapter 6 and verse 23. And on the new moon of the first month, and on the new moon of the fourth month, and on the new moon of the seventh month, and on the new moon of the tenth month, are the days of remembrance and the days of the seasons in the four divisions of the year. So it's These calling them new moons. But just as our forefathers have done, even in the, the, the regular scriptures and calling them new moons, the, the new the word in Hebrew just so happened is the same word for new month and new moon. That's all it is. It's the beginning of the new months, and these four days mark the four days of the beginning of the seasons, as it's stating here. These are the day. Now, the tenth, uh, you've got the new month or the day of the the first month, the fourth month, the seventh month, and the tenth month. We're going into the seventh month. It says are the days of remembrance and the days of the seasons in the four divisions of the year. These are written and ordained. Go ahead and read. These are written and ordained as testimonies forever. Mm -hmm. Right. Verse 24. And Noah ordained them for himself as feasts for the generations forever. So they that they have become thereby a memorial unto him. And on the new moon of the first month, he was uh, bit, bidden to make for himself an ark. And on the day, the earth became dry, and he opened the ark and saw the earth. And on the new moon of the fourth month, the mount of the depth of the abyss beneath were closed. And on the new moon... Of the seventh month, all the mounts of the abyss of the earth were open, and the waters began to descend into, into them. And on the new moon of the tenth month, the tops of the mountains were seen, and Noah was glad. And on this account, he ordained them for himself as feasts for a memorial forever, and thus as they ordained. So you got these feast days for these four days in the calendar year that mark the coming in of fall, winter, spring, and summer. If you want to start in the spring, spring, summer, fall, and winter. These are ordained as we're reading forever. Go ahead and read. And they placed them on the heavenly tables. Now tablets. Each uh, yeah, on the heavenly tablets, each had uh, 13 weeks from one to another past their memorial from the first to the second and from the second to the third and from the third to the fourth. Verse 30, and all the days of the commandments will be two and 50 weeks of days. And these will make the entire year complete. So in other words, 52 weeks in the year, 5-2. Go ahead and read. Thus, it is engraven and ordained on the heavenly uh, tablets, and there is no neg neglecting this commandment for a single year uh, or from year to year. So he said that there is no neglecting this commandment for a single year or from year to year. Read on. And command thou the children of Israel that they observe the years according to this reckoning, 364 days. And this will continue complete. Com constitute a complete year. With, and this will constitute a complete year, and they will not disturb its time from its days and from its feast, for everything will fall out in the in them according to their testimony and they will not leave out any day nor disturb any feast so we're being told that we're not to disturb these days 
from their times and from their days, from the feast. He says, uh, let me read. It says, and command thou the children of Israel that they observe the years according to this reckoning, 364 days, and these will constitute a complete year. And they will not disturb its time from its days and from its feasts, for everything will fall out in them according to their testimony. And they will not leave out any day nor disturb any feast. So we got to make sure we're following it exactly the way he's telling us to. If we don't, the feasts are going to fall out of their proper seasons, which it goes on to tell us. Read on. Verse 33. But if they do neglect and do not observe them according to his commandments, then they will disturb all their seasons and the years will be this dislodged from this order. And they will disturb the seasons and the years will be dislodged and they will neglect their ordinances. So we're being told that if we don't observe them according to his commandment, then we're going to disturb the seasons and the years. They will be dislodged from their order, which is exactly what you're seeing happening in Israel today. Go ahead and read on. And all the children of Israel will forget and will not find the path of the years and will forget the new moons and seasons and Sabbaths, and they will go wrong as to all the orders of the years. Do we not see that happening in Israel? This prophecy is coming true right before our eyes. And you got foolish men in Israel that is that want to stick to their pride. And instead of dropping their pride and saying, hey, you know what? We are going wrong. We're going off. What are we doing adding a 13th month to the year? What are we doing? What, like, what are we following? But they let their pride get in the way. And they've got almost all of Israel falling away seasons all out of whack high holiday high holy days all out of whack some following the sliver moon some following the dark moon some following the full moon everybody doing what they want to do go ahead and read uh verse 35 for i know and from henceforth will i declare it unto thee and it is not of my own uh devising for the book lies written before me and on the heavenly tablets the division of days is ordained lest they forget the feast of the covenant and walk according to the feast of the gentiles after their error and after their ignorance and that's exactly what we're doing we're walking according to the feast of the gentiles following after the other nations and the moon and now our seasons are all out of whack. Our high, our high holy days are all out of season. And everybody's doing what they want to do. Go ahead and read. Um, they were talking about making a new calendar because of, uh, recently uh, I saw that. Oh, wow. Talking yeah. about Esau? Yeah, Esau, yeah. Huh. The, the Gentiles. It's crazy. Uh, verse 36. For there will be those who will... Uh, surely make observations of the moon, how it disturbs the seasons and comes in from year to year, 10 days too soon. So we were told this was going to be happening. This was a prophecy written right here in the book of Jubilees, explaining to us what would happen if we followed the moon following after the Gentile nations. And that's why you will have one year, 10 days behind, a second year, 10 days behind. And then by the time you get to that third year, you will fall 10 days behind. Now the whole year is a month behind, behind the season. You fall, you find yourself an entire 30 days behind. Now you've got to add another month, a 13th month in order to bring the calendar back in line with the seasons if you're following the moon it's written right here and you've got men in israel that got so much pride that instead of saying hey wait a minute these men may be on to something let us go and research and read and find find this out for ourselves Maybe we 
just might be doing our high holy days wrong. But they're letting pride and preeminence get in the way that, you know, like, who are these two guys? What do they know? There's some fools. They're reading Enoch. <laughs> they're bug outs. Who's the bug out? Somebody that thinks the moon dictates seasons or the person that's following what is written and what has been prophesied. It is what it is. Go ahead and read that part again. For there will be those who will uh, uh, certainly make observations of the moon, how it disturbs the seasons, and come in from year to year, 10 days too soon. Read on. Verse 37. For this reason, the years will come upon them when they will disturb the order and make an abominable uh, day the day of testimony. And, uh, and an unclean day, a feast day. And that's exactly why the Most High was pissed off at us to begin with. That's why he said, I hate your feast days. He hates our new moons. He hates our feast days. Why? Because they've become sin to him. How did they become sin? Number one, because we're doing them on the wrong days. We're not following the calendar properly. Go ahead and read. And they will confound all the days the holy with the unclean and the unclean day with the holy for they will go wrong as to the months and sabbath and feast and jubilee mm -hmm. for this reason i command and testify to thee that thou mayest testify them for after thy death thy children will disturb them so that they will not make the year 364 days only. And for this uh, reason, they will go wrong to the new moons and seasons and Sabbaths and festivals. And they will eat all kinds of blood with all kinds of flesh. So this is a prophecy that came true. So are we going to listen to the prophecy that is written by our forefathers? that warned us of the very mistakes that we're making right now? Or are we going to continue listening to men that are leading you astray by the mistakes that they're making and following the moon? When we were told specifically that following the moon is going to throw our seasons out of whack. See, I'm watching. We, we don't get very many people watching. But there are people that you can see the number going up and down. People are like, oh, man, what are they talking about? I'm jumping off. Which is sad. It's crazy. Israel has got to stop listening to these men and read these books for yourselves and get understanding so that we could follow these high holy days the way they are ordained. Um. Give me a second. Let's go to the book of Enoch chapter 2 and verse 1. And you're going to read uh, verses 1 through 3, Enoch 2 and 1 through 3. The book of uh, Enoch chapter 2 and verse 1. Observe ye everything that takes place in the heavens, how they do not change their orbits, and the luminaries which are in the heavens, how they all rise and set in order each in its season, and transgress not transgress not against their uh, appointed order. Behold ye the earth and give heed to the things which take place up, uh, upon it from first to last. How steadfast they are, how one of the things upon how earth, the things, how none of the things upon earth, how none of the things upon earth 
change, but all the works of God appear to you. Behold, the summer and the winter, how the whole earth is filled with water and clouds and dew and rain lie upon it. All right. So he's telling us, observe ye everything that takes place in the heaven. He's telling us to observe it. The one thing we were told not to do is to worship them, which is one of the big mistakes our forefathers made. They started worshiping these things just like the other nations. Uh, go to Enoch 3 and 1. The book of Enoch chapter 3 and 1. Observe and see how in the winter all the trees uh, seem as though they had withered and shed all their leaves, except 14 trees, which do not lose their foliage, but retain the old foliage from two to three years till the new comes. Okay, so he's given us a little example of winter time, little description of winter. What happens in the winter time? The, the, the trees start to wither away, the leaves start to fall off, except for the 14 trees that are mentioned that don't do that. All right. What about summer? Go to uh, uh, foreign one, Enoch foreign one. Yeah. Book of uh, Enoch chapter four and verse one. And again, I've served ye the days of summer, how the sun is above the earth over against it. And you, and you see shade and shelter by reason of the heat of the sun and the earth also burned with growing heat. And so you cannot tread on the earth or on a rock by reason of its heat. So what is it dictating? What is it that dictates these seasons that we're reading about winter and summer? What is it? Is it the moon? It's not the moon that dictates seasons. It is the sun. It is the earth's rotation around the sun and it's, um, and its path, which is elongated, which is elliptical, in certain parts, it gets closer to the sun. And in certain parts of that ellipse, it goes further away from the sun. Simple concept that we were taught in school. Let's go to Enoch chapter 72 and verse 1 through 37. We're not going to go through the whole calendar. We're going to read what's written here in the books. Uh, again, if you want to see everything about the calendar, go watch our other videos. We broke down the day. We broke down the week. We broke down the month. And we broke down the year. Go and watch the videos. All right, go ahead. You're going to read uh, verses 1 through 37. The book of uh, Enoch, chapter 72 and verse 1. The book of the course of the luminaries of the heavens, the relation, the relations of each according to their classes, their doings and their seasons, according to their names and places of origin, and according to their uh, months, which Uriel, the holy angel who was uh, with me, who is their guide, showed me, and he showed me all their laws exactly as they are. And how it is written regard regard to all the years of the world. And unto eternity till the new creation is com accomplished, which uh, dureth till in eternity. And this is the first law of the luminaries. The luminaries, the sun has its rising in the east portal of the heavens. And it is setting in the west portal of the heavens. And I saw six portals in which the sun ray rise and six portals in which the sun set and the moon rise and set in these portals and the leaders of the stars and those who they lead six in the east and six in the west and all following each other. So hold that right there real quick. Uh, I just wanted to uh, show something real fast because he just mentioned in uh, 72 and one, it says, according to their names and places of origin and according to their months, which Uriel, the holy angel who was with me, who was their guide, showed me. So this same Uriel, who's being mentioned here in the book of Enoch, go to 2nd Ezra chapter 4, verse 1. 
the same Uriel is the same angel that went to Ezra. The book of Second Ezra, chapter 4 and verse 1. And the angel that was sent unto me, whose name was Uriel, Uriel, gave me an answer. Go ahead and verse 2. Okay, and said, Thy heart had gone too far in this world, and thinkest thou to comprehend the way of the Most High? So the same angel, Uriel, that we're reading about right here in the book of Enoch is the same Uriel that you read about in what book? The Apocrypha. His name is not mentioned in the regular Bible. Michael is, and uh, who's the other one? Um, Gabriel are mentioned. But Uriel is only mentioned in the Apocrypha. So, because his name isn't mentioned in the regular Bible, is that going off? You know what I mean? It, it, it's just crazy. So here he is, the same angel being mentioned here. All right. So go ahead. And I just wanted to point that out in case anybody um, starts to wonder, okay, who is this Uriel? He's the same Uriel that uh, went to Ezra that you read about in the book of Ezra, who is Ezra. All right. Uh, go ahead, though. Uh, verse four, in accurately corresponding order. Also many windows to the right and left of these portals. And first there goes forth a great luminary named the sun. And his circumference is like the circumference of the heaven. And he is quite filled with illum illuminating and heating fire. The chariot on which he ascends, the wind drives, and the sun goes down from the heaven and returns through the north through the north in order to reach the east and is so guide that he comes to uh, appropriate uh, appropriate comes to appropriate portal appropriate portal and shines in the face of the heavens in this so way in order to understand more about the portals and all of that go and watch our video on the year which we completely break down what these 12 portals are and how the sun goes through those 12 portals that corresponds to the 12 months. All right. That's what it's going into right now. And how many portals are there? As we read, it's going to tell you there are 12 portals, not 13. There is no way you can add a 13th month, which we read about in the Zondervan Compact Bible Dictionary. That there's a 13th month added, which all of the camps are almost all the camps because there are a few that are trying to keep the Enoch calendar, but they're following the moon and adding that 13th month, which there's only 12 portals, 12 months. Go ahead and read though. Verse six, it says shines in the face of the heavens. In this way, he rises in the first month in the great portal, which is the fourth those six portals in the, in the cast. And in that fourth portal from which the sun rises in the first month are 12 windows openings. I think that's a, a typo. It should say east. The six portals in the east. Go ahead and read them. Oh, instead of cast? Yeah. Okay. Um, in the openings from which proceed a flame when they are open in. Uh, their seat when they're open in their seasons, when the sun rises in the heavens, he comes forth through that fourth portal 30. Mor uh, morning in succession and sets accordingly in the fourth portal in the west of the heavens. And during the period, the day becomes daily longer and the night nightly shorter to the 13th morning. To the 30th morning? To the 30th morning. On that day, the day is longer than the night by a, a night part. And the day amounts exactly to 10 parts and the night eight parts. 
and the sun rises from the fourth portal and sets in the fourth and returns to the fifth portal of the east 30 mornings and rises from it and sets in the fifth, in the fifth portal. And then the day becomes longer by two parts, amounts to 11 parts, and the night becomes shorter and mounts to seven parts. And it returns to the east and enters into the sixth, sixth portal and rises and sets in the sixth portal one and thirty morning and according of its sign. On that day, the day becomes longer than the night and the day becomes double night, then double the night and the day becomes twelve parts. And the night is shorter and becomes six parts. And the sun mounts up to make the day shorter and the night longer. And the sun returns to the east and enters into it, into it, uh, into the sixth portal, and rises from it and sets 30 mornings. And when the th uh, third 30 mornings are accomplished, the day decreases by exactly one part and becomes 11 parts and the night seven. And the sun goes forth from the sixth portal in the west and goes to the east and rises in the fifth portal. 40, uh, portal for 30 mornings. And sets in the west again in the fifth in the fifth west portal. On that day, the day decreases by two parts and mounts to ten parts and the night to eight parts. And the sun goes forth from the fifth portal and sets in the in the fifth portal of the west and rises in the fourth polar portal for one and thirty mornings according of its sign and sets in the west on that day the day is equalized with the night and becomes equal length and the night amounts to nine parts and the day to nine parts and the sun rises from the portal and sets in the west and returns to the east and rises 30 mornings in the third portal and sets in the west in the third portal. And on the day, the night becomes longer. The day and the night become longer than night. And the day is shorter than day till the third, uh, 30th morning. And the night amounts exactly to 10 parts of the day to 8 parts. And the sun rises from the third portal and sets in the third portal in the west and returns to, to the east. And from 30 mornings rise in the second portal in the east and in the like manner sets in the second portal in the west of the heavens. And on the day, the night amounts to 11 parts and the day to seven parts. And the sun rises on that day from the second portal and sets in the west in the second portal and returns to the east in the first portal for one and 30 and 30 mornings. And sets in the first portal in the west of the heavens, and on the day the night becomes longer, and the and the amount of the double of the days, and the night amounts exactly to twelve parts, and the day to six, and the sun has therewith uh, traversed the division of his orbit and turns again uh, on those divisions of his orbit. And enters that portal 30 mornings and sets also in the west. Uh, in the west up opposite to it. And on that night has the night decreased in length by a ninth part in the night. And the, and the night has become 11 parts and the day 7 parts. And the sun has turned and entered into the second portal in the east and returns on, tho on those his divisions of his orbit for 30 mornings rising and setting. And on the day the night decreases in length and the night amounts to 10 parts. And the day to 8. And on the day the sun rises from the portal and sets in the west and returns to the east and rises in the third portal for one and thirty mornings and sets in the west of the heavens. Uh, one that, on that day, the night decreases and mounts to nine parts and the day to nine parts and, and the night. And the night is equal to the day, and the year is exactly as to its days, 364. And the length of the day and of the night 
and the shortness of the day and of the night rise through the course of the sun. These dis distinctions are made. Uh, so it comes that it is course becomes daily longer and its course nightly shorter. And this is the law and the course of the sun and his return as often as he returns 60 times and rises. The great luminary, which is named the sun forever and ever. And that which does rise is the great luminary and is so named according to its appearance, according as the Lord commanded, as he rises, so he sets and decrees not and rests not, but runs day and night. And his light is sevenfold brighter than that of the moon, but as regards size, they are both equal. So what this is doing is giving you a rundown of how the sun, how the, the earth goes in an orbit around the sun through these 12 portals, one in the north, south, the east, and west of the sky. Okay. As they go through these portals, as you're uh, heading through, uh, let's say, starting off in the springtime, the the day um, is about equal, just about. As it starts going towards summer, the daytime gets longer, the nighttime gets shorter, and then when you get to fall, it starts to reverse. Now, you know, it starts to go backwards where the day is still longer, the night is still shorter, but it's going backwards to where they're going to become equal again. And then it's going to get to the point to where the night is going to be longer than the day as it goes through its cycle. That's what this is going into as you go into these what? the spring, the summer, the fall, and the winter as you go through these months. Showing you it's the moon that dictates the, I mean, not the moon, it's the sun that dictates this. Let me not say it wrong. The body, see, you said the moon. <laughs> say it wrong. It's the sun as it's showing is the one that dictates this. The great light, the great illuminary, the big light, not the lesser light, not the moon. Now we're going to get into the moon. Let's go to chapter 73 and read from verse 1 to verse 8. The book of uh, Enoch, chapter 73 and verse 1. And after this law, I saw another law the, dealing with the smaller luminary, which is named the moon. And her circumference is like the circumference of the heavens. And... Her chariot in which she rides is driven by the wind, and light is given to her in definite measure. And her rising and setting change every month, and her days are like the days of the sun. And when her light is un, un when the light is uniform, uh, it uh, it amounts to the seventh part of the light of the sun, and thus she rises. And her first phase in the east comes forth on the uh, third, thirteenth morning. Thirtieth morning. Thirtieth morning, and on the day she becomes visible, and constitutes for you the first phase of the moon on the third thirtieth day, together with the sun in the portal where the sun rises. And the one half of her goes forth by a seventh part, and her whole circumference is empty without light, with the exception of one seventh part of it. And the fourteenth part of her light, and when she received one seventh part of the half of her light, her light amounts to the one seventh part and half thereof. And she sets with the sun, and when the sun rises, the moon rises with him and receives the half of one part of light. And in that night, in the beginning of her morning, in the uh, com commencement of the lunar day, the moon sets with the sun and is invisible that night with the 14th part and the half of one of them, and she rises 
on that day with ex exactly the seventh part and comes forth and re recedes from the rising of the sun. In her remaining day, she becomes bright in the remaining 13 parts. Okay, so this is giving us a little rundown of the moon. Now, again, as we said, as we're going through and reading this, you got to ask yourself the question. What makes more sense? What we're reading or what Israel almost as a whole is observing? Following the moon. Seasons all out of whack. High holy days all out of whack. Some people following the dark moon, some following the sliver, some following the fool, some following the lunar Sabbath. But they profess that they're men of God. But they won't follow what the Most High told us to follow. And they will go into great lengths into all other books to try and prove their doctrine rather than reading what's written. Let's go to uh, chapter 74 and 1 through 16. It's going to give us a little bit more information about the moon and also will fall in line with what we read earlier in the book of Jubilees. Go ahead and read. The book of Enoch, chapter 74, and verse 1. And I saw another course, a law for her. And I how we're talking about the moon. Go ahead. The law for her. And how according to the law, she per performs her monthly, her monthly revolution. And all these, Uriel, the holy angel, who is the leader of them all, showed to me and their positions. And I wrote down their positions as he showed them to me. And I wrote down their months as they were, and the appearance of their light till 15 days were accomplished in single seven parts. The, she accomplished all her light in the east, and in single seven parts accomplished all her, all her darkness in the west. And in the certain months, she altered her settings, and in certain months, she pursues her own peculiar course. In two months, the moon sets with the sun in those two middle portals. She, she third. It says in two, in two months, the moon sets with the sun in those two middle portals, the third and the fourth. Oh, yes. Thank you. Two middle uh, portals, the third and the fourth. She goes for, forth for seven days and turns about and returns again through the portal where the sun rises and accomplishes all her lights and she recedes from the sun and in eight days enters the sixth portal from which the sun goes forth. And when the sun goes forth from the fourth portal, she goes from seven days until she goes forth from the fifth and turns back again in the seventh day into the fourth portal and accomplishes all her light. And she recedes and enters into the first portal in eight days. And she returns again in seven days into the fourth portal from which the nine, the nine sun goes forth. Thus I saw their position, how the moon rose and the sun set in those days. And if five years, and if five years are added together, the sun has an overplus of 30 days and all the days which are uh, a cure to which, it. For, and all the days which accrue. Which accrue, accrue to, to it for one of those five years when they all are full amount to 364 days and the overplus and the overpulls of the sun and of the stars of the sun and the overplus of the suns and of the stars amount to six days in five years, six days every year come to 30 days and the moon falls behind the sun and the stars and the stars to number of 30 days and the sun and the stars bring in all the year exactly so that they do not 
advance or delay their position by a single day unto entirety, but Inter complete the in eternity, but completely complete the year which per perfects justice in 364 days. Let me read that part again. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to start at verse uh, 11. It says, and all the days which accrue to it for one of those five years when they are full amount to 364 days and the overplus of the sun and of the stars amounts to six days in five years, six days every year it comes to 30 days and the moon falls behind the sun and stars to the number of 30 days and the sun and the stars bring in all the years exactly so that they do not advance or delay their position by a single day unto eternity, but complete the years with perfect justice in 364 days. So it's letting us know that it is the sun that determines the, the year and the moon falls behind the sun by every um, three years, but in, uh, by a number of 30 days. All right, so start in verse uh, 13. Verse 13, in three years, there are 1,092 days, and in five years, 1,820 days, so that in eight years, there are 2,912 days. For the moon alone, the days amount in three years to 1,062 days. So and in five there. So mm -hmm. for the moon alone, the days amount in three years to 1,062 days which when you compare it to verse 13, in three years, there are 1,092 days. That's a difference of what? 30 days. All right, go ahead and read. Uh, and in five years, she falls 50 days behind to the sun of to the sum, thousand, to the sum of 1,000. To the sum mm -hmm, of 1,770. All right, there so... You go to uh, that 1820 and subtract that 1,770 and so on. So we show you all of this in the uh, video on the year. We don't want to get too much into it. Go ahead. There is five to be added 1,062 days. And in five years, there are 1,770 days so that for the moon, the day six, in eight years amount to 21,832 days. For in eight years, she falls behind to the amount of 80 days. All the 17 days she falls behind in eight years are 80. And the year is accurately completed in conformity with their world stations and the stations of the sun, which rise from the portal through which it the sun rises and sets 30 days. So what this is saying, listen closely to this, that in eight years, the moon will fall behind by a number of 80 days. That's almost three full months. That's two days. That's two months and 20 days. Think about that. If your season, if your, uh, your Passover begins let's say uh just for sake of argument just uh, to keep it even let's say it's uh april 1st in springtime which we know it's not but let's say it's april 1st go back 80 days which is going to take you from april to march 1st from march 1st to february 1st from February 1st almost to January, to like January 10th, your Passover is going to end up in January after eight years if you don't add the 13th month in the third year. You're going to fall behind 80 days. That's the reason be behind the adding of the 13th month when these camps are following the year. Because if you... Isn't that what almost happened to us? We were got out of our camps and we're like, what is going on? We're following it exactly how they told us to. And next thing we knew, our, our Feast of Tabernacles was almost in February. Or actually it was, I mean, uh, not, not Tabernacles, uh, Passover. 
was going to end up being in February. The you know the following year is like if this keeps going on, we're going to have end up having our Passover like in the middle of February. We got to figure this out. We've got to go and research. And it took a year of going through to figure this out and to get the understanding that, you know what, we've been following the moon, following these men that taught us this and they've been, you know, teaching us wrong. That's not what the scriptures teach. Let's go to uh, Enoch 75 and one through nine. The book of Enoch, chapter 75 and verse 1. And and the leaders of the heads of thousands who are placed over the whole creation, over all the stars, have also to do with the four intercalendary days, being inseparable from their office, according to the reckoning of the year. And these render service on the four, four days which are not which are not reckoned in the reckoning of the year. And owing the to them, men go wrong therein. For those luminaries truly render service on the world, world stations, one in the first portal, one in the third portal of the heavens, one in the fourth portal, and one in the sixth portal. And the a, exactness of the year is accomplished through its separate, separate 364 stations. We notice that we keep reading that over and over again. 364, 364, 364. Go ahead and read. For the signs and the times and the years and the days, the angel Uriel showed to me, who the Lord of glory has set for ever over all the luminaries of the heavens, in the heavens and in the world, that they should rule on the face of the heaven and be seen on the earth and be uh, leaders for the day and the night. The sun, moon, and stars, and all the ministries, creatures which make their revolution in all the chariots of the heavens, in like manner, 12 doors, in like manner, twelve doors, Uriel showed me. Upon in the circumference of the sun, chariots in the heavens, uh, through which the rays of the sun break forth, and from them is wrath, Dif uh, wrath diffused over the earth when they are open at their appointed seasons, and for the winds and the spirit of the dew when they are open. Standing open in the heavens at the at the ends, as for the twelve portals in the heaven and the ends of the earth, uh, out of which go forth the sun, moon, and stars, and all the works of heaven in the east and in the west, there are many windows open to to the left and right of them, and one window at its or appointed season produces wrath. One. Correspond uh, uh, produces wrath, produces warmth. Oh, I said uh, warmth. Uh, season pro produces warmth, uh, corresponding as these do to those doors from which the stars come forth, according as he has commanded them, and wherein they said, uh, corresponding to their number. And I saw chariots in the heaven running in the world above those portals in which revolve the stars that never set. And one is larger than all the rest. And it is that that makes its course through the entire world. All right. So let's go to uh, chapter 82. You're going to read 1 through 20. The book of Enoch, chapter 82 and verse 1. And now, my son Methuselah, all these things I am recounting to thee and written down for thee. And I have revealed to thee everything and given thee books uh, concerning all these. So preserve, my son Methuselah, the books from thy father's hand and see that thou deliverest them to the generations of the world. I have given wisdom to thee 
and to thy children, and thy children that shall be to thee, that they may give it to their children for generation, this wisdom, namely, that passeth there through. There though. And, uh, there though. So this and wisdom, those, namely, that passes their thought. Thank you. This wisdom, namely, that passes their thought. And those who understand it shall not sleep, but shall listen with their uh, their ear that they may learn this wisdom. And it shall please those that eat therefore better than good food. Bless are all the righteous. Bless are all those who walk in the way of righteousness and sin not at the at the sinners. In the reckoning of all their days in which the sun tra uh, traverses the heavens, entering in, into and departing from the portals for 30 days with the heads of thousands of the order of the stars, together with the four which are in intercalated, 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 which divide the four portions of the year, which lead them and enter with them four days. Owing to them, men shall be at fall and not reckoning them in the whole reckoning of the year. That's yeah, why what you see today in these calendars that are being used in Israel, they're they're talking about an intercalary month. People that are following the lunar Sabbath, they're talking about intercalary days. They're using the concept to follow their own calendar, to follow their own heart. But instead of following the four intercalary days that the Most High told us to follow, that's, that's how foolish some of these men are. They're going to disregard the four intercalary days that the that the most high told us to keep disregard the books but take the concept and create their own intercalary month or intercalary days it, it makes no sense it's crazy right it says for they belong to the reckoning of the year and are truly recorded thereon forever one in the first portal one in the third um and one in the fourth and one in the sixth, and the year is completed in 364 days. We're not following what the Most High told us to, that these four intercalary days are added to the year in their seasons, one for the spring, one for the summer, one for the fall, and one for the winter. All right? Um, I just, I just cut that. Up. I just read that on verse six. <laughs> right. Um, go, go ahead and read it again and go to seven. Uh, so it says, for they belong to the reckoning of the year and are truly uh, recorded thereon forever. One in the first portal and one in the third and one in the fourth and one in the sixth. And the year is completed in 364 days. And the account thereof is accurate, and the reckoning, reckoning thereof it's exact. And the recorded reckoning thereof exact. And the recorded reckoning thereof exact. For the luminaries and the months and the festivals and the years and the days, as real showed and revealed to me, uh, to me, to whom the Lord of the whole creation of the world had subjected the host of heaven. And he and he has power over night and day in the heavens to cause the light to give light to men, sun, moon, and stars. And all the power of the heavens which revolve in their circular chariots. And these are the orders of the stars which set their places and in their seasons and festivals and months. And these are the name of those who lead them, who watch who watch that they enter at their times, in their orders, in their seasons, in their months, in their periods of dominion and in their positions. There are four leaders who divide the four parts of the year into first, and after them, the 12 leaders of the uh, orders who divide the months. And for the 360 days, there are heads over thousands who divide the days. And for the four intercalary days, there are the leaders which sunder. The four part of the year 
and these heads over thousands are intercal uh, intercalated between leaders and leaders each behind a station but their leader may the division and these are the name of the leaders who divide the four parts of the year which are ordained uh Mil milkiel helam helamelik and mele meleha and Nar narel and the names of those who lead them ad narel and ija susael and elomael these three follow the leaders of the orders and there is one that followed the three leaders of the orders which followed those leaders of stations that divide the four parts of the year in the beginning of the year melkahal rise first and rules who is named Tam tamayani and son and all the days of his dominion Will he bear rule are 91 days. And these are the signs of the days which are to be seen on earth in the days of his dominion. Sweat and heat and calm and all three bear fruit and leaves are produced on all the trees. And the, hev the, the harvest of wheat and the rose flowers and all the flowers which come forth in the field but the trees of the winter season become withered, and these are the name of the leaders which are under them. Berkael, Zelabzel, and another who is added a head of thousands called Hilujaseth. And the days of the dominion of this leader are at, at the end. The next leader after him is Helamelech, who one named the shining sun and all the days of his light are 91 days. And these are the signs of his days on the earth, glowing heat and dryness and the trees rip, uh, ripping their fruits. I mean, ripen their fruits and produce all their fruit ripe and ready. And the sheep pair pair and become pregnant and all the fruit of the earth are gathered in and everything that is in the field. The wine press, these things take place in the day of his dominion. These are the names and the orders and the leaders of those heads of thousands, Gidal, Gidahal, Kiel, and Hiel, in the name of the head of thousands, which is added to them, Asphael, and the day of his dominion are at the end. All right. So this is dealing with the four intercalary days um, that deal with the four seasons, spring, summer, fall, and winter. This coming uh, week, we're going to be dealing with the one with fall. These are ordained um, uh, feast days, all right? And they're like a, a double feast day because you've got that feast. And then the day afterwards is the, the new month, the beginning of the month, which going into the seventh month is the memorial blowing of trumpets. All right. So that's what we're going to get into next. Lord's will you understand these four intercalary days? Um, you have two months of 30 days. And then on the third month, you have 31 days, which is really 30 days plus the one intercalary day. Then you have another two months of 30 days and then another third month of 31 days, which will take you into the next intercalary day or next season. And then another two months of 30 days and then um, um, another month of 31 days and then so on. It goes on for four cycles two months of 30, one month of 31, which is really another 30. The uh, four intercalary days are not counted in the 30 day cycles. So it's really three 30, uh, three 30 day months is really what it is for 360 days in the year with the added four intercalary days, bringing it to a full 364 days. That's the way it's counted. So 
those uh, four intercalary days are treated as feast days, as we read. All right. So um, the memorial blowing of trumpets is immediately after that. So that's what we're going to get into next. The memorial blowing of trumpets. Actually, before we go to that, uh, go to Wisdom of Solomon 7 and 15 through 19. Uh, that's where I wanted to go to also to show you that the same thing that Uriel uh, was teaching um, Enoch, the same wisdom Solomon had. Wisdom was taught, I mean, Solomon was taught and given the same knowledge, the same wisdom about the uh, the calendar about uh, the the rotation of the sun and the seasons and all of that. Go ahead and read it when you got it. The book of Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 7 and verse 15. It says, God had granted me to speak as I would and to uh, conceive as it, as is meet for the things that are given me because it is he that leadeth unto wisdom and directeth the wise. For in his hand are both we and our words, all wisdom also, and knowledge of workmanship. For he had given me certain knowledge of the things that are, namely to, namely to know how the world was made and the operation of the elements. The beginning, ending, and midst of the times, the alterations of the turning of the sun, and the changes of seasons, the circuits of years, and the positions of stars. So Solomon was given the same education about what we're reading in the book of Enoch, about the revolution of the sun. The uh, let, let me read it. I don't want to mess it up. Says, for he had given me certain knowledge of the things that are, namely to know how the world was made and the operation of the elements, the beginning, ending, and midst of the times, the alterations of the turning of the sun, and the change of seasons. Because it is the sun that deals with the changing of seasons, not the moon, the circuits of years, which has to deal with the sun and the positions of stars. So if Solomon was given the same knowledge, why are we following the moon? How do we have men in Israel teaching us that it's the moon that dictates seasons and high holy days? It makes no sense. So we've got to understand that we can't keep following after these men go and read this stuff for yourself as we said so we're going to get into the memorial blowing of trumpets uh this is another high holy day that um the most high has ordained for us to keep uh which is at the beginning of the seventh month the first day of the uh seventh month uh, we were told to keep this as a memorial um, let's read about it. Uh, there isn't that much to it. We'll uh, give a few examples of how, you know, of the trumpets and things like that that were created. Uh, but let's start off with the uh, Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 1 through 2. So we're dealing with the memorial blowing of trumpets now, which is also coming up this week. The book of Leviticus, chapter 23, and verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, Concerning the feast of the Lord, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocation, even these are my feasts. So that's Leviticus 23 and 1. The Most High is commanding Moses to speak to the children of Israel concerning his feasts. He's saying these are his holy convocations. These are his feasts. Go to verse 4. Dropping down to 4. These are the feasts of the Lord, even the holy convocations which ye shall proclaim in their seasons. So he's letting us know these are the feasts of the Lord, even holy convocation, meaning holy gatherings, which ye shall proclaim in their what? In their seasons. Their seasons, meaning at the time he appointed. 
Some of them correlate with the spring, the summer, the fall, and the winter. Other ones fall in somewhere in between them, but they have appointed times, meaning they're appointed seasons. The word seasons, as you will uh, see if you go and watch our other videos on the calendar, that there's more than one definition to the word season or seasons. All right. So let's go to Leviticus 23 and 23 through 25. Leviticus 23 and 23. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, shall ye have Sabbath, a memorial of blowing the trumpets and holy convocation. Ye shall do no servile work therein, but ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. So this is in the scriptures. This is commanded by the Most High, the memorial blowing of trumpets. It is a high holy day. When is it? In the seventh month, in the first day of the month. He says, shall ye have a Sabbath, a memorial blowing of trumpets, and holy convocation. Now, granted, we are in captivity. It may be hard or impossible for some of our people to get every high holy day off. We understand that. We are in captivity, but we are commanded to keep the high holy days. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. But in no way are we to try and play it down be like, well, you know, uh, we've got to uh, rehearse the righteous acts. That is not an excuse. We can't keep using that as an excuse. Well, we are rehearsing the righteous act. Well, how come your memorial blowing of trumpets is on a different day than the other camp over there's memorial blowing of trumpets? Well, we got to rehearse the righteous acts. Everybody's got their own understanding. His understanding is different than my understanding. What kind of sense does that make? There should be one understanding, and that's the understanding that he has given us, which we are bringing out. But again, who's going to listen to us? We're a couple of nobodies. It is what it is. Every camp in Israel should be coming under this calendar. And if Lord's will that they could let go of the pride and just go and look at it and realize that, you know what? These brothers are not bugged out. All of us should be following this. You know how much easier it would be on Israel if everybody followed this calendar? Nobody would ever have to be asking, well, when is the Day of Atonement? When is Tabernacles? When is Passover? You will be able to look at your calendar from year to year because it would be falling in place in order every year at the same time every year. There would never be any confusion. None. But Israel loves confusion. Israel loves strife. Israel loves contention. Israel loves to do what they want to do. Every man wants to follow his own heart, which we've got to get out of Israel. We've got to get that spirit out of Israel. Let's go to Numbers 29 and 1 through 6. book of numbers chapter 29 and verse 1 and in the seventh month on the first day of the month you shall have in holy convocation you shall do no servile work it is a day of blowing of the trumpets unto you and ye shall offer a burnt offering for a sweet savior unto the lord one young bullock one ram and seven lambs of the first year without blemish and their meat offering shall be a flour mingled with oil three tenth deals for a bullock and two tenth deals for a ram 
and one tenth deal for one lamb throughout the seven uh, throughout the seven lambs, and one kid of the goats for a sin offering to make an atonement for you, besides the burnt offering of the month and his meat offering, and the daily burnt offering and his meat offering and their drink offering according unto their manner for a sweet savor a a sin a sanctif a sacrifice made by fire unto the Lord. So here in Numbers 29, 1 through 6, again, he's repeating the the day, the month, and the day that this high holy day falls on in the seventh month on the first day of the month. He also goes on to give what burnt offerings that we were supposed to do on this month. Now, since we're under Christ, Christ was that lamb. He was that perfect sacrifice. We no longer do the sacrifices. What you will do on that day, what replaces those burnt offerings is you giving your sacrifices of praise. Giving your, your body as a living sacrifice. giving using this as a day of prayer a day of a day of uh, of prayer and shouting out praise to the most high for everything he's done for us memorializing remembering everything that he's done for israel over these years Thanking him for us even still being here when he could have destroyed us like he started to. Let's go to Numbers 10 and 1 through 10. The book of Numbers, chapter 10 and verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Make three, uh, make the two trumpets of silver. Let me read that again. Make thee two trumpets of silver of a whole piece. Of a whole piece shalt thou make them, that thou mayest use them for the calling of the assembly and for the journeying of the camps. And when they shall blow with them, all the assembly shall assemble themselves to thee and to the door of the tabernacles of the congregation. And if the blowing, but, and if they blow, but with one trumpet, then the princes, which are heads of the of the thousands of Israel, shall gather themselves unto thee. When ye blow an alarm, then the camps that lie on the east part shall go forward. When ye blow an alarm a second time, then the camps that lie on the south side shall take their journey. They shall blow an alarm for their journeys. But when the congregation is to be gathered together, ye shall blow, but ye shall not sound an alarm. And the sons of Aaron, the priests, shall blow with the trumpets, and they shall be to you for an or ordinance forever throughout your generations. And if ye go to war in your land against the enemy that oppressed you, then ye shall blow an alarm with the trumpet, and ye shall be remem uh, remembered before the Lord your God, and ye shall be saved from your enemies. Also, in the day of your gladness, and in your solemn days, and in the beginnings of your months, ye shall blow with the trumpet over your burnt offerings, and over the sacrifice of your peace offerings, that they may be to you for a memorial before your God. I am the Lord your God. So these two trumpets were created especially for certain purpose. Number one, calling the assembly together to the tabernacle, the congregation, when it was time for, you know, the, on the Sabbath day to come into the temple or to go into the, the assembly or bring this assembly together, the trumpet was blown. All right. Um, there was one, one, uh, one blow from the trumpet. When there was uh, an attack coming towards the the, the camp, there was a, the trumpets were used to blow an alarm. These silver trumpets that we just read about that were created, that were made, which the Most High told Moses to have made. 
All right. Um, when it was time for the congregation to be gathered together away from um, the tabernacle or the uh, the temple, the the uh, the horns were blown. All right. So we got to keep that in mind. And why were these blown? Again, he says, also in the day of your gladness, meaning our what? Our feast days and in your solemn days, going into our feast days. And in the beginnings of your months, when you, how would I put it? Before you get to the book of Samuel, there's nowhere in the scriptures where you find that the most high call, the beginning of our months, um uh what do you call them uh moon um new moons you don't find you don't find uh the term new moon being being used at all he uses the beginning of your months the beginning of months or the beginning of your month that's when those horns were to be blown which are the new months the beginning of the months which just so happened to have the same date or not same day, but the same name of, I believe the word is Kadesh, which is uh, also as new moon. The same name as the moon. And that though in certain places throughout the scriptures, that's what they put instead of using new months, they put new moon. That's also what's causing confusion in Israel is that the word new moon shouldn't be being used. It should be saying new months or beginning of your months in several places where the new moon is being used. Let me read that again. Also in the day of your gladness and in your solemn days and in the beginnings of your months, you got to ask yourself the question, why didn't he say in the new moons? The Most High knows what he meant here. He meant in the new months, in the beginning of your months. Ye shall blow with the trumpets over your burnt offerings and over the sacrifices of your peace offerings, that they may be to you for memorial before your God. I am the Lord your God. Let's go to Ezekiel 33 and 1 through 9. So those silver trumpets were created for that reason. Today, we've got, you know, and a lot of us probably have them, the uh, shofars, the ram's horns that we use to blow, to blow with on the day of uh, memorial blowing of trumpets. All right, Ezekiel 33 and 1 through 9. Go ahead and read that when you got it. The book of Ezekiel chapter 33 and verse 1. Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of thy people and say unto them, when I bring the sword upon a land, if the people of the land take a man of their coast and set him for their watchman, if when he seeth the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet and warn the people, then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet and take it not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet and took not warning. His blood shall be upon him, him, but he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. But if the watchman see the sword come and blow not the trumpet, and the people be not warned, if the sword come and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. And so thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth and warn them from me. When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die. If thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Nevertheless, 
if thou warn the wicked of his ways to turn from it. If he do not turn from his ways, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. And this is heavy because he uh, set up these watchmen on the towers to keep watch over the city. So if there was a, an opposing army coming, his job was to blow with the trumpet to warn the people. And that's what he's telling us, that we as teachers of Israel, our job is to warn the people. And that's what we're trying to do right now. We're trying to warn our fellow brothers in the faith, our fellow brothers in the Israelite community, that what we are doing by following the moon is, is wickedness in the eyes of the Most High. It's evil in his eyes that we are not following the high holy days the way he told us to. So we've got to warn them. And you can, and this goes with any, any person that we as, uh, as teachers of the scriptures, teachers of the Lord, men of the Lord, as some people may call them, some people love glorying in the, we're the prophets of the most high. I'm a prophet. Well, you know, whatever title, whatever word you want to use, but, teachers we're your brothers we have to warn our people that's why he says when i say unto the wicked O wicked man thou shalt thou shalt surely die if thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way that wicked man shall die in his iniquity but his blood will i require at thine hand and we've often met people or come across people that you know we've tried to teach the truth to try to show them the, the, the truth. We're the Israelites. We have to repent as Israelites. We've got to keep God's commandments. We got to repent from our sins. And even people in our families, they'll reject it. So let's say you, you knew that a person in your family was wicked or a friend, co-worker, and you didn't try and teach them. You didn't try and warn them and teach them the scriptures. And they were in their sin and they you knew they were in this sin and you didn't say nothing and they end up dying in their sin. He's telling you that blood is on your hands. As a teacher in Israel, that blood is on you. You have that family member, that friend, co-worker, whatever it is. Whatever their sin is, they, they could be a thief. They could be a liar. They could be a murmurer. They could be a, an adulterer. They could be a murderer. Whatever the case is, a lot of, you know, some of us, we've got um, people in our, in our families that, you know, drug dealers that were or, uh, gang members, all of that. It, it's almost unavoidable in the so-called black, Hispanic, and Native American communities. All of us have family members that fall into any of these categories. And if you don't take the time to warn them and they die in their sin, that blood is on you. But a lot of us, out of love for our family members, out of love for friends or a cohort, whatever it is, you're showing them true love by being a watchman for them. That's why it says, nevertheless, if thou warn the wicked of his way to turn from it, if he do not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity. But thou has delivered thy soul. So if you've got that family member that you say, you know what, man, I love you so much. I want to warn you. I want you to know and understand that the way you're going God is not with that. And you teach them the scriptures, you teach them the way, and they reject it. He lets you know he shall die in his iniquity. It's not an if and or there's no if and or but about it. It shall. He shall die in his iniquity. They're going to die in their sin. And there's nothing you can do about it. Because the Most High has made the decision. The Most High is fed up. He's like, you know what? You've come to the height of your sins. I've got to take you out. But you know what, Brother Ezra? 
you know what, brothers of Rubabel, you know what, brother, whoever, you've delivered your own soul because you did what you were supposed to. You brought the scriptures out and you showed them and they rejected me. They rejected my word. They rejected my commandments. So it's not on you. You did your job. It's on them. They're going to die in their iniquity. And we're seeing it happening over and over and over again in Israel. And our people still are not hearkening. They still don't want to listen. Our people still don't want to repent. Even though we're watching people die daily, daily in their sins. I don't get it. I, I'm not understanding it. Again, nevertheless, if thou warn the wicked of his way to turn from it, if he do not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity. But thou hast delivered thy soul. Keep that in mind. Let's go to Numbers 31 and 1 through 6. The book of Numbers, chapter 31 and verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Avenge the children of Israel and the Midianites. Afterwards shall thou be uh, gathered unto thy people. And Moses spake unto the people, saying, Arm some of yourselves unto her war, and That's let them war. unto the war, and let them go against the Midianites and avenge the Lord of uh, Midian. Of every tribe of thousands throughout all the tribes of Israel shall ye send to the war. So there were delivered out of the of the thousands of Israel, a thousand of every tribe, twelve thousand armed for war. And Moses sent them to the war, a thousand of every tribe. Uh, them in Phineas, the son, Phineas, how'd you say it? Phineas. Phineas, the son of Eleazar, the priest to the war with the holy instruments and the trumpets to blow in his hand. So here it is that Moses sent Israel out against the Midianites to go to war. And he followed exactly the commandments that the Most High gave him, that if we go to war, what do we do? We take those trumpets out to war with us and blow those trumpets. And that's exactly what Moses commanded of our people, which was commanded to him of the Most High. Now, also, he in this war, he uh, was commanded to tell the children of Israel that they need to bring a thousand men of each tribe to the war, which when we went out to war, we had 12,000 men. All right, so there was 12,000 to the war, and they followed the commandments of the Most High by bringing the trumpets. How were these trumpets used? Let's go to Joshua 6 and 1 through 27. This is how those trumpets were used in this particular war. The book of Joshua, chapter 6 and verse 1. Now Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said unto Joshua, See, I have given it thine hand, Jericho, and the king thereof, and the mighty men of valor. And ye shall compass the city, all ye men of war, and go round about the city once. Thus shalt thou do six days. And seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram, uh, seven trumpets of ram's horns. And the seventh day ye shall compass the city seven times, and the priests shall blow with the trumpets. And it shall come to pass that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when ye hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat, shall fall down flat, and the people shall ascend up every man straight before him. And Joshua, the son of uh, Nun, called the priests and said unto them, Take up the ark of the covenant and let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horn before the ark of the Lord. And he said unto the people, Pass on and compass the city and let him that is armed pass 
on before the ark of the Lord. And it came to pass when Joshua had spoken unto the people that the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of the ram's horn passed on before the Lord and blew with the trumpet and the ark of the covenant of the Lord followed them. And the armed men went before the priests that blew with the trumpet and the reward came after the ark the priest going on and blowing the trumpet. And Joshua had commanded the people saying, you shall not, uh, you shall not shout nor make any noise with your voice. Neither shall any word proceed out of your mouth until the day I bid you shout, then ye, uh, shall ye shout. So the ark of the Lord passed the city going about it once and they came into the camp and lodged in the camp and Joshua rose early in the morning and the priest took up the ark of the Lord and seven priests bearing seven trumpets of rams horns uh, before the ark of the Lord went and continued and continually and blew with the trumpet and the armed men went before them but the re reward came after the ark of the Lord the breeze going on and blowing with the trumpets. The re reward is the like the the rear ranks in the the you know the marching of the men. Verse fourteen, and the second day they compassed the city once and returned it unto camp. So they did six days, and it came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early about the uh, dawning of the day and compassed the city after the same manner seven times only on that day they compassed the city seven times and it came to pass at the seventh time when the priest blew the trumpet joshua said unto the people shout for the lord had given you the city and the city shall be a curse even it and uh, all that are therein to the lord only rahab the harlot shall live she and all that are with her in in the house because she hid the messenger that went that 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 we sent. Verse eighteen. And ye, in any wise, keep yourselves from the uh, from a cursed thing, lest ye make yourselves cursed. When ye take of the cursed thing and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. But all the silver and gold and vessels and brass and iron are uh, consecrated into the Lord. They shall come into the treasure of the Lord. So the people shouted when the priest blew the trumpet, and it came to pass when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, and the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat so that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. And they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both man and woman, young and old, and ox and sheep and ass with the edge of the sword. But Joshua had said unto the two men that had uh, speed out the, the country, go into the heartless house and bring out these, uh, these the woman and all she had as she swore unto her. And the young men that were spies went in and brought out Rahab and her father and her mother and her brethren and all the, that she had. And they brought out all her kindred and left them without the camp of Israel. And they burnt the city with fire and all that was therein, only the silver and the gold and the vessels of the brass of iron they put into the treasure of the house of the Lord. And Joshua uh, saved Rahab the harlot alive and her father, her father's household and all that she had. And, the, and she dwelt in Israel even unto this day because she hid the messengers which Joshua sent to spy on Jericho. And Joshua said, uh, and Joshua adjured them at the time saying, curse be the man before the Lord that rise up and buildeth his city, Jericho. He shall lay the foundation thereof in his firstborn, and in the youngest, and the youngest son shall he set up the gates of it. So the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame was noised throughout all the countries. All right. Um, 
is go to the book of Judges, chapter 7, verse 15 through 18. So we just read in Joshua, um, you know, an example of how the trumpets were used in war. Uh, we marched around the city, the trumpets were blown, the people shouted, the walls of Jericho came down, and we got ourselves a victory. Okay. Um, so now let's go to Judges 7 and 15 through 18. The book of Judges, chapter 7 and verse 15. And it came in, not it came, and it was so when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and the interpretation thereof that the worship uh, worshiped and returned into the host of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord had delivered it into your hand, the host of Midian. And he divided the 300 men into three uh, companies, and he put a trumpet in every man's hand with empty pitchers and lamps within the pitchers. And he said unto them, Look on me, and do likewise. And he, and behold, when I come to the outside of the camp, it shall be that as I do, so shall ye do. Verse 18, When I blow with a trumpet, I and all that are with me, uh, then blow ye the trumpet also on every side of all the camp, and say, The sword of the Lord and on Gid and of Gideon. All right, so this is just uh, another example of showing how when our uh, men went to war, they brought the trumpets with them and blew with the trumpets. All right, go to First Chronicles 15 and 25 through 29. The book of First Chronicles, chapter 15 and verse 25. And it says, So David and the elders of Israel and the captains over thousands went to bring up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord out of the house of obed with joy. And it came to pass when God helped the Levites that bear the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord that they offered seven bullocks and seven rams. And David was clothed with a robe of fine linen, and all the Levites that are bear the ark, and the singers, and Shenania, the messenger of the song with the singers, David also had upon him an ephod, ephod of linen. Ephod or ephod? Uh, ephod. Ephod of linen. Thus all Israel brought up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord with shouting and with sound of the cornet and with trumpets and with cymbals and cymbals making a noise with uh, placeries uh, and harps. And it came to pass as the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came to the city of David, that Michael, the uh, Michelle, the daughter of Saul, looking out at a window, saw King David dancing and playing, and she despised him in her heart. All right. So, again, um, here's the, the Levites bearing the ark. And, you know, they were bringing the ark into the city. You know, they were making noise with the, the trumpets blowing, got the instruments playing, you know what I mean? And having a, a, a great, excited um, time. But what was part of that celebration? The trumpets. So you can see the trumpets was something that our people use frequently in the celebrations. Um, let's go to Psalms 81 and 3 through 5. Psalms 81 and 3 through 5. The book of Psalms, chapter 81, in verse 3. And it says, Blow up the trumpet in the new moons in the time appointed on our solemn feast days. 
for this was a statue for Israel and a law of the God of Jacob. This, this he ordained in Joseph for a testimony when he went out through the land of Egypt, where I heard a, a language that I understood not. So Psalms 81 and 3 is talking about the memorial blowing of trumpets. It's not talking about the new moon. Okay, what this really should be saying, we break this down uh, fully in our lesson about the calendar. It says blow up the trumpet in the new moon should be the new month in the time appointed because we were commanded to blow up the trumpet at the beginning of our months. It's not later in the scriptures where suddenly the word new moon starts being replaced for beginning of months or new months in the time appointed, which was what? The first day of the seventh month at even that we would what? Blow up the trumpets, which is what? Our solemn feast day. That's what it's talking about here in Psalms 81 and 3 through 5. For this was a statute for Israel and a law of the God of Jacob. This he ordained in Joseph for a testimony when he went out through the land of Egypt, where I heard a language that I understood not. So this goes back to Leviticus 23 and so on. That is describing the, uh, the memorial blowing of trumpets. That's the feast that this is talking about in Psalms 81. I know some people like to go here to try and prove um, whether they're doing the dark moon or the sliver moon or full moon um, observance of the feast. For whatever reason, they love to go to Psalms 81 and 3 because it uses the word new moon. Blow up the trumpet of the new moon in the time appointed on our solemn feast day. See, it's about the new moon. It's not talking about the new moon. It's talking about the memorial blowing of trumpets. All right. Let's go to Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 1 through 12. Oops. Nehemiah. I lost Nehemiah. <laughs> Here we go. I lost it for a second. <laughs> All right. Uh, Nehemiah 8. The book of Nehemiah, chapter 8, and verse 1. It says, and all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate. And they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and all that could uh, hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. Upon the and first he, day of the what? On the first day of the seventh month. On the first day of the seventh month, which would be the memorial blowing of trumpets. So they came together as a congregation, and Ezra read in the book of the law. He started teaching them out of the law. All right, go ahead and read. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until uh, midday, before the men and the women and those that could understand and the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law and Ezra the scribe stood upon a pulpit of wood which they had made for the purpose and besides him stood Mattathiah and Shema and Ananiah and Uriah and Hekekiah and Messiah and on his right hand on his left hand Pediah and Mishael and Malachiah and Hashem and Hasabod Daniah, Zechariah and Meshulam. 
And Ezra opened the, the book in the sight of the people, for he was above all the people. And when the when he opened it, all the people stood up. Respect. And Ezra blessed the Lord and, gra and great. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. And all the people answered, Amen, Amen, with lifting up of, of their hands. And they bowed their heads and worship the Lord with their face to the ground. Also, uh, Jesh, uh, Jeshua and Benai and Sherebiah and Jamin, Akun, Shabbethiah, Hodiah, Masediah, Keleta, Azariah, and Josabah, Hanan, Pelaniah, and, and the Levites caused the people to understand the law. And the people stood in their place. So they read in the book of the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reasoning. Yeah, the reading. And, and the reading. So right. what's going on here is uh, they just came out of captivity, come back into Jerusalem. Um, you know, this is going to be a time of the rebuilding of the temple. Uh, all this is going on. Um, they're trying to come back into the knowledge of keeping the high holy days and things like that and keeping the law. And this is one of the first high holy days that they're keeping. They're keeping the um, memorial blowing of trumpets, as you read in verse two, where it says "Then Ezra, the priest, brought the law before the congregation, both the men and women and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. They were celebrating at this time the uh, memorial blowing of trumpets. Um, let's go to First Ezra 9 and 37 through 55. So this is the version of the same story that you can read in the book of First Ezra in chapter 9. When we go into uh, verse 37 and going to read through verse 55. Feels like I'm losing my voice. I don't know why. A little bit, yeah. Uh, the book of First Ezra, chapter 9 and verse 37, and it says, And the priests and the Levites, and they that were of Israel, dwelt in Jerusalem, and, the, and in the country in the first day of the seventh month. So the children of Israel were in their habitations. And the whole multitude came together with one accord into the broad place of the holy porch towards the east. And they spake unto Ezra, the priest and reader, that he would bring the law of Moses that was given of the Lord God of Israel. So Ezra, the chief priest, brought the law unto the whole multitude, from man to woman and to all the priests, to hear the law in the first day of the seventh month. And he read in the, in the broad court before the holy porch from morning unto mid, midday, before both men and women and all the multitude gave heed unto the law. And Ezra, the priest, and the reader of the law stood up upon the multitude of uh, the pulpit of wood, which were made uh, for that purpose. And there stood up by him Mathathias, Samias, and Ananias, Azarias, Urias, Ezekias, Bela, Belas Amas up on their right hand, and upon his left hand stood Faladias, Misael, Me, Melchias, Lothiabus, and Nabarias. Then, to, uh, then took Ezra the book of the law before the multitude, for he sat uh, honorably in the first place in the sight of, the, of them all. And when he opened the law, they stood all straight up. So Ezra blessed the Lord God, God most high, the God of hosts almighty. And all the people answered, Amen, and lifted up their hand. They fell to the ground and worshipped the Lord. Also, Jesus, uh, Jesus Annas, Serebias, Adonias, Je Jecubus, Sabbatias, Auteas, uh, May, Mayanias, and Calibtias, Azarias, and Joasabdias, 
and Ananias by by Atias, the Levite taught the law of the Lord, making them with all to understand it. Then spake Atharites unto Ezra, the chief priest and reader, and to the Levites that taught the multitude, even to all saints. This day is holy unto the Lord, for they all wept when they heard the law. So then, so then, and eat the the fat, drink the sweat, and the and send part to them that have no thing. For this day is holy unto the Lord, and be not sorrowful, for the Lord will bring you to honor. So the Levites uh, publish all things to the people, saying. This day is holy to the Lord, be not sorrowful. Then went they their way, uh, everyone to eat and drink and make merry and to give part to them. They had nothing and to make great cheer, because the, they understood the word wherein they were in, instructed and for the which they had been assembled. All right. Um, so you can see... Uh, that first Esdras is kind of like a rehash of what we read in Nehemiah. Um, gives a little bit more information, but as you can see, they were celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles, you know, relearning, finding out that it was ordained. Um, everybody was on one accord. They were, you know, gathered together. Um, and you can see the emotion that, you know, that they had, you know what I mean? And, and coming to that celebration. Whereas here we are today in 2022 and our people still can't come together under one accord to celebrate these high holy days, which is a shame. There, there is no reason, especially now seeing that the um, information is coming out as, in regards to this calendar and how this calendar works. There is no reason that any of our people should be following the moon and going into these doctrines anymore. It shouldn't be happening. Every camp, every Israelite should be falling under this calendar, all under one accord. If, if the Jewish could all, I mean, basically all they do is they all just come together, put out the calendar, and they're all on one accord. There is no arguing. There is no fighting. There is nobody trying to get preeminent saying, no, you're wrong. With they, they all know that they follow the sliver moon and whatever is on the calendar. All of all of the Jewish people from that are over the Israelis that are over there in Israel today to Europe, to America, to wherever they're spread across this world. They all follow the high holy days together. There is no infighting. There is no argument. There is no problem at all. We know we're not supposed to be following the uh, the sliver moon, but I'm just using that as an example. Okay. Um, when you go into uh, Revelation, um, the you know we know that the Most High is going to be returning with the sound of a trumpet. All right. So that trumpet is going to sound. Christ is going to return. So this, uh, these trumpets play a significant role in Israel, okay? So again, we have coming up, um, I'm gonna share my screen real quick. Hold on, let me go here. Um, like here. No, that's wrong. That's not what I'm going to do. I'm going to go here. There we go. So let me share my screen real quick. Can you see that? Yes. All right. So here we are going into the seventh month. All right. This is
the fall. So this is going to do Tuesday. So this is um, Tuesday. This is Wednesday, the fourth day of the week. As you can see, this this calendar falls in line from year to year without fail. All right. Um, this is from 20. Uh, well, it doesn't have the, the year on it from I was going to say 2021, but it's not. This is just where it will fall. So this fall fall uh, feast. I don't know why my, my mouth's getting all dry and tongue tied, but this fall feast would actually start on Monday at sundown. All right. This 31st day of the month, which is actually inter called the intercalary day, is not a day that's actually counted in the county. It's 360 days plus the four intercalary days of the season, the seasonal days. So this day will begin on Monday or this feast at sundown and go until Tuesday at sundown. On Tuesday at sundown, we'll begin the memorial. That's what MBO stands for, Memorial Blowing of Trumpets. We'll start on Tuesday at sundown and go until Wednesday at sundown, which is the first day of the seventh month. The first day of the seventh month is the memorial blowing of trumpets, which actually begins at sundown of the previous day. If you understand how the most high days work, if you don't understand, go and watch our video on the days. We have video on breaking down the day. We've got another video that's about four hours or more long dealing with the week another video that's just as long dealing with the month and another one dealing with the year. If you really want to fully understand the breakdown of the Enoch calendar and, um, and how it applies to Israel. Now, mind you, in the first three videos, we didn't even bring out the book of Enoch. We don't bring out, we don't bring out any of the other books because we don't have to because we prove everything from the scriptures that everything that the Enoch calendar is teaching falls in line with what you read about in the scriptures and giving examples of how the calendar is being used in the scriptures, showing you how some of these precepts that people are using to follow the moon are precepts that are being misinterpreted. Okay, so we wanna make sure that we understand. Let's go to the beginning so you understand what we're talking about. This is how this calendar works, all right? Don't want to go too far ahead. The new year, you have the spring comes in, that first intercalary day, which is what do you call the 31st day or zero day. However, I put it on here as the 31st day. All right, which would actually start on this day, on Tuesday, which is the second day. That's why we have first day, second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day, seventh day, because the seven day work week does not run along with the days of the month and year. Okay, when you read Genesis, the illuminaries, the sun, the moon, the stars were all created on the fourth day of the work week. That's why the monthly calendars and the yearly calendars start on the fourth day of the seven day work week cycle. The calendar starts here and ends here and it just cycles yearly without fail. That's why we're saying all of Israel should be following this calendar. And we're not saying this to boast. We're just saying it because it's the truth. And this is the one way that Israel should be coming together under one, on one accord to keep the high holy days. The problem is that there is so much pride in Israel. So many of these leaders don't want to let go of the following the moon. They don't want to do it. 
We pray that they will do it. This is the one way that Israel can come together. All the high holy days will fall in their proper season from year to year without fail. You see, I'm seeing it again. People are jumping on as soon as we start talking about the calendar and the Enoch and the, you see them jump off. It's sad. It's crazy. As you can see, Passover, the 14th day of the first month, which is actually the 15th day, will fall on this Wednesday or fourth day of the week every year without fail. That's why we're saying there will never be any confusion. Nobody would ever have to wonder when is Passover. Nobody will ever have to wonder when is memorial blowing of trumpets because it's on that same Wednesday on the seventh month. No one will ever have to wonder when is Feast of Dedication because it's on that same Wednesday in the ninth month. It's simple. The Most High couldn't have made it any easier for us. The problem with Israel is that we always want to go away from what the Most High told us to do. It is what it is. Like we said, don't take our word for it. Go and watch the videos. We go over the precepts, precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little and there a little. Watch the videos. And determine for yourself, are we bugging out or are we following what the most? Because everybody else in Israel just about is following this. Let me read it again. This is calendar, page 98 in the Zondervan Compact Bible Dictionary and page 99. This is what it's reading. During the Bible period time was reckoned solely on astronomical observation. Days, months, and years were determined by the sun and moon. Days of the week were not named by the Jews, but were designated by ordinal numbers. The Jewish day began in the evening with the appearance of the first stars, which that part is true. Days were subdivided into hours and watches. The Hebrews divided nights into three watches, which is true. The seven-day week, which this agrees with what we're teaching right here. The seven-day week is of Semitic origin. Egyptians had a week of 10 days. The Jewish week had its origin in the creation account and ran consecutively irrespective of lunar or solar cycles, which we're showing you. That's why at the beginning of the calendar, we have the first day, second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day, seventh day. That's why we're saying you're following this, you're following confusion, because on one hand, it's agreeing with the Enoch calendar that the days of the week of the seven day work week, let me read it again. The seven day week is of Semitic origin. Egyptians had a week of 10 days. The Jewish week had its origin in the creation account and ran consecutively irrespective of lunar or solar cycles. It's irrespective of the other cycles. Whereas you have people following the lunar cycle that don't believe in the seven day work week. The lunar cycle is not correct. That's not biblical whatsoever. All right. And some of the same people that follow the lunar cycle are the same ones that will pull out the Zondervan Compact Bible Dictionary and teach out of it. Even though the Compact Bible Dictionary agrees with what we're showing you here, we're going to get to where it goes off. Okay. Which again, you follow this, you're following confusion. 
Uh, it says this was done for man's physical and spiritual welfare. The biblical records are silent regarding the observance of the Sabbath day from creation to the time of Moses. Sabbath observance was either revived or given special emphasis by Moses. The Hebrew month began with the new moon before the exile months were designated by numbers after the exile names adopted from the Babylonians were used. Synchronized Jewish sacred calendar. And then it gives you the names of those months, Nisan, Iyar, Sivan, Tammuz, and so on. Elul, Tishri, Hezvan, Keslev, Tibet, Shabbat, and Adar. And as we stated earlier, there are some people that are adopting this second month of Adar doctrine where they're adding a 13th month to the calendar, which they're getting from what? From this, which we're going to continue reading. It says the Jewish calendar had two concurrent years, the sacred year beginning in the spring with the month Nisan and the civic year beginning with Tishri numbered in parentheses above. The sacred year was instituted by Moses. And this is what we were talking about at the beginning of the lesson. They're giving Moses credit for this calendar, which you cannot find anywhere in the scriptures. It says, the sacred year was instituted by Moses and consisted of lunar months of 29 and a half days each with an intercalary month called Adash and I every three years. You cannot find this in the scriptures. You cannot find this in the Bible. You cannot find this in Enoch, cannot find this in Jubilees. You cannot find this in Jasher. None of those books, but yet in this book right here that everybody loves to run to, they're saying that Moses in the five books of Moses in the Torah says that there are 29 and a half days in a, in a month, which is not true. It also is saying that there is a intercalary month, a 13th month which you do not read in the book, in the Bible. This is a lie. It's lying. And that's what they do. They put some truth with lies. They have this. They put the truth of the, the seven-day work week in there, and they completely go left. So again, you do the comparison. Go and watch the videos of all these other camps that are teaching you to follow the moon and watch the videos that we've put out and you make the comparison yourself. Which one makes sense and follows the scriptures of what's written? Because if you're following the moon, it doesn't matter if it's sliver, full, dark, or lunar Sabbath. You are going to fall behind in your seasons of, of your high holy days. Your Passover, which is supposed to start, which is in March, which is around the, uh, the middle of March, is going to end up all the way in December. In five years, as we read in Enoch, 80, you fall behind 80 days. Go 80 days from this number here. This is the middle of March, the middle of February, the middle of January. You're going to be in the middle of December trying to hold Passover in five years if you don't add that 13th month after three years, which is unbiblical. And every camp is following that. Even the ones that are not telling you they're adding the 13th month, they are adding it. How do we know? Because we're watching their calendars. Their calendars of a couple of years ago or so fell in line with ours Last year, it went uh, about uh, 10 days behind our calendar. And then suddenly this year, 
they're right back with us. How did that happen? Because they added the 13th month. The only people they're fooling are the people in their congregation whose eyes are shut that don't want to go and read the truth. So like you said, um, this, we've got uh, two feast days coming up this week. Um, Lord's will, you, you will go and research and come to the understanding and make the change as we had to do. Let the pride go and follow what is written because otherwise you're following the hearts of men. You're following the, the doctrines and commandments of men, which we are commanded not to do. So it's up to you. You can keep following the moon and fall into foolishness, or you can follow what is actually written. All right. Um, with that, let's go to the uh, book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 12 and verse 13 through 14. The book of uh, Ecclesiastes, chapter 12 and verse 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. And with that, we're going to say shalom, most high in Christ blessed. Uh, enjoy the rest of the Sabbath, and we'll see you next Sabbath.